Welcome to the Market Huddle with Patrick the Content Machine Serezna and Kevin the Macro Tourist Muir. So grab a drink, get comfortable, and get ready for a deep dive into the markets. Take it away, guys. It's February 14th, 2020, episode 67. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we welcome Martin Pelliche, Portfolio Manager at TriVest Wealth Council, a Western Canadian firm offering investment services for wealthy families and private clients. Then, in my favorite segment, Talking Charts with Patrick, we go through the ESG names. Oh, where you, there you go. And this week in trading history, we're going to go back to the Pets.com IPO and finally end with our WTF video with Professor Stiegel. Is it Stiegel? Uh, it's close enough. Keep All going. right, there we go. We discussed the top three things to watch next week. So before we get started, Lena, hop on. We're going to do some beers. Yeah, for sure. So this week's beer is Cowbell Brewing Company's Doc Produce Bobcat. All right. So uh, tell us the story it's here. It's a red ale. So there is a story. Doc, uh, Doc Perdue was Blythe's vet veterinarian in the late 1880s who had a penchant for collecting exotic animals and a love mm -hmm. of drink. When once cut off for being overserved at a local saloon, he marched home and returned with a bobcat on a leash, threatening to let it loose if he didn't get another drink. <laughs> Sounds like a Friday night for you, Patrick. There you go. That's awesome. You know what? I'm, I'm not a huge fan, but I'm going to give it the huge thumbs up just because I love the story so much. Well, actually, this is a good beer. Yeah. What are you shitting on the beer already? Well, I'm not right, sure. Well, yeah, we Kevin likes it. I know. You, you won't like it. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah. of laughs> okay, Lena, we're right. lucky enough to have another sponsor. Why don't you do your magic there, Lena? Of course. So our second sponsor for this week's Market Huddle is Coifin. Coifin is a new platform that gives you professional-grade data and tools to analyze stocks and understand macro trends. It's a personal Bloomberg terminal for those who don't have $25,000 a year to spend on a Bloomberg. The best part, it's completely free. Go to coifin.com today, K-O-Y-F-I-N.com. Lena, you're getting pretty good at that. Yeah, I had to read it a few <laughs> this times, thing, but yes. This whole thing doesn't work out. you got to get a job on radio. <laughs> I got to okay, have a backup me, plan. <laughs> that's right. Uh, let me do my legal stuff. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in the show. Side effects of too much huddle may include incurable Trump cough, market sheet paranoia, death ball, death ball, <laughs> death bell, top calling nausea. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's get on with the show. Joining us now is Martin Pelliche, the... Uh, Portfolio Manager for Trivest Wealth. We were just chatting, and Pat, uh, Martin, you told us a line that I thought was so unique, so kind of quintessentially Canadian. I got I to gotta hear the whole story. You were telling us that your ancestors came to Canada almost uh, a little more than 350 years ago, and uh, why don't you tell us that story? And welcome, yeah. and welcome to the show, by the way. Oh, thank you for having me. So... We've got some deep roots, uh, deep French-Canadian roots. I'm a direct descendant of the first Pelche family that, that came to Canada in 1647. Now, coincidentally, I didn't mention this to you, but um, you know, there's a line of risk-takers and ADHD within the family. Uh, the first person that was guillotined in France happened to be a Pelche as well, so we're, we're, we're a little bit of troublemakers. <laughs> but, uh, um, so there was a father and two sons that came over, and the story was is that... Uh, the, the two sons had a bet to see if he could get closest to the to the waterfall without going over. And uh, you know, my uh, my direct my direct descendant is the one that lost the bet because the one that won actually went over the waterfall and died. So uh, <laughs> even though we have some some ADHD within the family, uh, we certainly have uh, a little bit of common sense as to you know, how far to push it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> that makes me laugh. So why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, where you went to university, and how you got your start in the business? Yeah, so I was I always had a passion about about investing from a very young age. Do you guys ever hear this? Of this, uh, I'm not sure what vintage you are or not, but uh, I'm Gen X, and uh, there's yeah. this this great board game, and I really suggest uh, um, you know see if you can pick one up used online. It's called Stock Ticker. You guys ever heard of it? No, I've never heard no. of it. We're both Gen Xers. We're like, but I didn't uh, heard of it. Yeah, it's, I've never heard of it. 
no. awesome game. So it's a game that you have uh, a pig and a pig for oil, a pig for grain, a pig for stocks, a pig for bonds, and so and industrials, and so on, and, and and so on. And so you roll the dice, and it goes into positive territory, and, and then you get a dividend. If it's in positive territory, it rolls into negative territory, you lose a dividend, but you could buy and make money on capital gains just based on the dice. And uh, that game really. The, That's uh, awesome. Got, yeah, it's a great game, and I, I got my uh, my youngest boy um, when when he started playing when he was nine. And, you know, he took a thousand bucks through to the fifty grand. So you know, he's my next PM. They're going to be hiring. <laughs> 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 um, but, but it's a great game, and and I, so I always had a passion from investing from an early age. Um, you know, I started trading when I was uh, a teenager. I did terrible. I, did, I picked stocks by their their cool sounding names. So I remember the first stock I bought was called Valdez <laughs> Gold. I had no idea what it, what it actually, you know, how much gold to produce, or even if it did produce gold. But uh, I wish that I had, you know, um, you know, found Briex to be an uh, exciting name, but Valdez was more exciting to me at the time. <laughs> you know, you know, it's funny, yeah. Martin. I'll, I'm going to just interject because uh, yeah. Brie, Briex was one of my first investments, and it's still actually uh, on my wall. The certificates. Um, nice. uh, I, ha- I have him framed. It's. Uh, anyway. I don't think you should say nice because I think he he wrote it all the way down to zero. <laughs> if he's well, got I, the certificate, I, that means it's worthless <laughs> and that he didn't sell, Martin. <laughs> anyway, Martin, go on. I, uh, you should buy an Oldsmobile and uh, get Matthew McConaughey to sign it, both the Oldsmobile and the uh, and the and the <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. And so anyway, I, I I got into investing and uh, I really enjoyed it. I was the youngest person to at the time to write the Canadian Securities course. I was seventeen or eighteen at the time, um, and uh, so it was kind of geeky, but uh, it was kind of fun. And, uh, and and so I did that. And then um, I worked in uh, during my summer summer jobs. I, I worked in the bank. I was I go in for the rent. So imagine this young whippersnapper who's you know, 19 years old, sitting in the in the branch manager's office for uh, while well, he was on holidays and and you know making bank loans and mortgages and you know just kind of winging it. So it was uh, it was quite the experience um, until we got robbed and I had a shotgun put to my head. But that was a different story. Oh, okay, that's yeah. a different story. So, so that made you go into investment banking. <laughs> That made me, uh, yeah, it's a bank. It made there's a sign from above that, uh, you know, this is just too dangerous for me. So, you know, why not take it a step further and go to eye banking? Right. And, uh, but anyway, so I did that and went into, uh, went to university, finished my university, uh, met some Swedish girls, and I said, you know what? It looks like a nice place to visit. So I went and did some international business over in, in Puerto Pro. <laughs> So Sweden. basically, you you went and chose your next university, your grad school university, by the the girls that you were chasing. I just, it, you know, sometimes, you know, things just happen, you know, or, you know. Better, <laughs> I, I'll take that as a yes, Martin. <laughs> um, I actually met a Swedish girl and, and, and lived in a hippie colony in Cadiz and, and surfed. And, uh, and Oh, God, that's got to be cold surfing in Sweden. No, no we, in Spain. Uh, met a Swedish oh, you guys, you met a Swedish girl and went to Spain. That's a lot smarter. Okay. And so, yeah. and, and that's where you surfed. Okay. It's all about diversification. Okay. It's all about diversification. Okay. <laughs> right? That's right. And, uh, and so I did that for a while and I became a pretty good surfer and, and, uh, and then, you know, ran out of money. I, and my parents sell their, sell my car for me and I ran out, spent that pretty quick and so they get back to reality. So I started interviewing for jobs. And uh, and and invest. I was looking at anything on the buy or sell side, and then I got into the uh, into the sell side. Um, coincidentally, met another girl who ended up being my wife, and took the job in Calgary. So uh, uh, that's where I landed, and I've been here ever since. Right. So you come back to Calgary, and so who do you work for in Calgary, uh, and and what's your job? Are you an investment banker and a research analyst? What are you doing? So I got into capital markets as a research associate, uh, worked at two firms, uh, worked my way up into an analyst and senior analyst um, and in, in energy. I, I, I didn't really – so the, the funny story how I, uh, I got my got the job, um, The I was interviewing, and um, the first interview, they got my resume mixed up with a good buddy of mine, and his resume was stronger than mine, and uh, it was similar because we both went to Sweden and chased girls. Um, but, uh, and so I got in based on his resume and then I wind and dined them through my interview. And, and then I told him, I said, at the end of the interview, I said, by the way, I think you've got my buddy's resume mixed up with mine. 
and uh, the rest was history. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we should say that that first firm was Griffith McBurney, right? Uh, no, so I started with Canaccord as an associate. Oh, um, you did? Okay. I did, and then I, moved, the- over to, <clears throat> then I moved over to GMP. Um, the, because it was, it was just, a it was a firm that was leading in, in energy. And then, right, but I was, gonna, I was, go, and, uh, sorry, I was just going to laugh because I was going to say can Accord probably uh, admired your hustle by not saying yeah. anything about the fact yeah. that you, that you got mixed up and they're like, this is our kind of guy. He, he well, milked it for what? everything he could get. I, I give young people advice on this when it comes to interviewing. They, I, I did a, a piece on a company called Anderson Exploration. And my cousin was the uh, geologist there, and so I did. I spent a whole week um, going through the company and analyzing the company. I didn't know much about energy, um, other than my dad working in, in pipelines, and and so I really hustled for a whole week. And I wrote a report on a whole uh, cell side report on Anderson, and I actually provided some insight to the analyst that he didn't even know about the company because I spent you know some, a, a thorough amount of time going through it from the from the bottom up. And I mean, it wasn't the best well written, but it was it was showing some initiative. And uh, all kidding aside, I mean that that was the that was the final decision that got me into into the business. And so I really recommend that young people, when they're when they're getting into uh, into the business, try and find something unique, a, a different way of 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 demonstrating that you know you can learn a lot and that you can learn a lot in a short period of time. Right. Right. Okay. So you're at Can. So you start at Canaccord. You go to Griffiths, and then you eventually you go back to Canaccord. You you do yeah. your stint as kind of uh, yeah. on the sell side as a research uh, or analyst. Yeah. But we all know that the research analysts back in those days were more like investment bankers. But we won't go there. Um, and then eventually, <laughs> and then eventually you go and you decide you want to start your own hedge fund. What's the timing of that, and how does it work? Well, it was tough because I was working eighty hours a week, but I was thirty. 33, 34 years old. And when I left, I made a, I was making a million dollars a year. Um, and so it was, it was tough. It was a tough decision. And, uh, but, but it just, you know, I had two kids and I saw the, 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 the damage it was causing to families. And, and so I decided to pull the ripcord and just coincidentally the, you know, that was July of 08 stampede. So it was a good time to quit. And then the market just uh, fell apart and so that forced me to think about what I wanted to do with this and consulting. And but I always, my heart was always going back to that stock ticker. My heart was always in in the buy side. And so I uh, I started a firm with a partner of mine, um, and he was on the buy side. He was a client at Cypress Capital and more investment management. And uh, and so we started up uh, the firm, and uh, we did you know a multidiscipline. Uh, um, you know, global diversified approach, but it also gave me a chance to set up a hedge fund for for energy, uh, doing long short and doing a lot of derivative work. I know you guys do a lot of option work, so uh, given the volatility in the sector, it was a great place to do some option option strategies on. And so I did that, and then yeah. 2014 hit, and uh, I'm like, this is a game changer, uh, a real big game changer, and it's time to shut this thing down. And we did, and uh, and and we focused entirely on a on our global family office approach. Right. And for those who don't know, that's when oil really shit the bed and went from yeah. what, 100 bucks to 20, 20 in the space of 26. What? Yeah. Yeah. Like in the space yeah, of I mean, you had, like six you months, had, nine months. Yeah. No, it was six months. And, uh, and then yeah. it went back to 50. I mean, it's been yo yo since then. But the U.S. over a 10 year period took oil from four to 10 to 12 million barrels a day. <laughs> and so oh, just, but, but what's just... even worse was the uh, Canadian uh, uh, West Texas. Uh, sorry, um, the uh, oh, WCS Canadian oil sand oil was just like uh, dumping. Yeah. It was down into the teens, wasn't it? It was pretty low. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Martin, yeah. And, and and so at that point, did you think that it was a, a, a? You said it was a game changer. Did you think that the world had forever changed in terms of? Yeah. Uh, yeah. energy and, and, and yeah. walk us through that thinking maybe like what you saw and why you decided to transition out of energy and into kind of traditional, not, I wouldn't call it traditional, but just kind of high end money management. Well, okay. So in, 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 if you're in energy space, you're in a price taker, uh, market and, and I don't like price. I don't like being a price taker. And I don't like uh, a market that's commodity. Uh, I don't like a commodity type of market because, you know, you're so susceptible to disruption 
on both demand and supply, but more so in the energy space on the supply side. Um, I, I mean, coincidentally, I mean, I was a young whippersnapper. I was traveling around the world with guys like Henry Groppi, who was an advisor to the Bush administration, and telling guys that peak oil was here, and no, there's never been technological re- uh new technology that's been able to crack open unconventional reserves. I mean, it was just the total wrong thing, the wrong story, but people were buying into it. And uh, and so I always try and question myself and talk to people who think differently than me um, and, and question my own thought patterns just to see where I could be wrong um, and, and then how do I adapt. And so, you know, we saw a wall of oil hitting the market with shale, um, horizontal multi-stage fracking was a game changer, but more so, I started to see um, some of the technology, the the data technology being applied to unconventional reservoirs, and that's what's really concerning. Um, I mean, you're you're applying downhole sensor technology, automated drilling, and artificial intelligence to optimize recovery rates by three to four percent. Doesn't seem like much, but that's huge in, in the oil business. And and suddenly, you have as much oil as you need. At the same time, you have uh, a, a global, uh, you know, stagflation in, in environment where you know you're just not seeing rapid growth in demand for for crude oil. Still seeing growth, but not rapid growth. Um, forget about the whole EV thing; that's garbage. But uh, uh, but you have as much supply as you need. And so I'm like, this is not a, a situation where you want to be long uh, for a long period of time. It's it's uh, and there's capital leaving. That's the other thing too. So um, liquidity is 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 my golden rule and uh and so you're fighting all kinds of things so you're better just to get out of the way okay so you get out of the way and you go and you start what the, like a private wealth management business and it, like yes. catering to kind of high net worth individuals is that is yeah. that the long long short of it yeah. and and do you yeah. do you specialize in any one part or is it just basically uh you know whatever it takes to to cater to the, their needs and and what have you learned as you've gone and made this transition into a different part of your career yeah so i mean this is there's i mean the, the understanding the last decade um has just been phenomenal like the, the the pace of disruption because of connectivity is unprecedented uh, and and it impacts every single sector and you're crazy if you don't think it doesn't impact markets it doesn't impact Wealth management. I was hanging out with a former iBank the other day. Trading desks on the iBanking side have been decimated, um, right. you know, because you have uh, compliance and, uh, and and guys are moving away from stock picking. I wrote an article about this for next week. Um, they're going more towards outsourced models and, and ETFs. And so, you know, it, I mean, now all of a sudden, trading and, and sales and trading isn't worth anything on a, on the on the sell side. On the on the wealth management side. ETFs have commoditized and democratized the entire business, um, good or bad. Um, you know, and so as a result, uh, if your uh, traditional way of starting a wealth management firm is by creating an in-house product and marketing said product, now you're in the low-cost manufacturing space, um, and you need size and scale. So if you're under a billion dollars in assets and you're creating products, um, I mean, it better be sure as heck be a really you know, uh, I don't know. Even still, um, it, it's it's a it's a, not a business that I want to be involved in. Okay, so you're you go and you start this wealth management, and yeah. what are what are the things that you kind of like? What are the kudos that you live by? Like, what what are you offering to the investor that uh, is different than what you get from like a Royal yeah. Bank or CIBC? Yeah, I, absolutely. So McKinsey did a really good report, and again, I'm maybe right. I'm right. I wrote about this for, for next week. So you're getting a, you're getting a little bit of a of a snapshot of it or a prelude. The you look at at at, at the value of the advisor and so the, the the value of of what someone's going to pay you for. They're not going to pay you to pick Bell or Telus, okay? Um, I mean, I mean, you could pay for advice. For you to do that yourself, it's a whole different. I mean, I'm not. I'm not talking about the do-it-yourself investor. There's a huge need for providing services to those do-it-yourself investors, and and whether it be options or whether it be stocks, that sort of thing. I'm talking about uh, someone who doesn't have time to do that. Someone who's you know five, ten million bucks, got a family office that um, you know want to generate X return for you know their operations, whatever the case may be, whatever the goals are, and so they don't have time and. And so the value proposition is in getting um, working on this called, something called goals-based benchmarking. So it's identifying what specific goal that that 
that family or individual wants to achieve? And what rate of return do they need to, uh, to generate to achieve that specific goal? And then how do you customize a portfolio to achieve that return and minimize the risk? So you're not trying to beat the market. You're not trying to, you know, it's, it, it, it's, so your benchmarking is based on that specific goal. So if it's 5 or 6%, how do we do that and take as little risk as possible? And you can do that through uh, portfolio proper portfolio construction, uh, risk management, multi-strats, um, you know, use of some alternatives. Like there's a whole, we have a whole process that we use to, to custom design portfolios based on that specific goal. And that's a future. Like that's happening in the U.S. at a record pace. Guys are leaving wirehouses, setting up U.S. RIAs. They're using camps or using uh, managed platforms that are world-class managers. Like you could buy, I don't know if you knew this, but you know Vanguard does active mutual funds and uh, is getting into private equity. Yeah, no, I did know that, but but I think yeah. a lot of people wouldn't know that they have. It's yeah. actually, I think, believe it or not, I think it's they have more assets under management that are active than passive. Yeah, so maybe I'm wrong. Get, maybe I'm wrong, but like it's some oh, crazy number. Yeah, yeah, like it's a large. Yeah, you know, I mean, they have, you can get access to Wellington in Boston. Oh, there used to be a client of mine, a really smart guys, good guys doing some good work there for fifty basis points. I mean, that's right. just outstanding. I mean, you just, you had to normally have to write a check for five million bucks to get that. Now you can just put, I don't know, a thousand or two grand in it. Now you're getting well into managing your portfolio. I mean, it's just, it's just outstanding. Right. Right. And so those are a kind of public market managers. Have you noticed yep. a real trend towards the, the private markets and, and uh, high yep. net worth individuals yep. clamoring yep. for private debt and private yep. equity yep. and other things like yep. that? And what do you yep. think There's about a, that? Well, it concerns me because, um, there's been so much demand for it that the liquidity premium's gone. So, I mean, you, you people don't realize the value of liquidity, right? I love liquidity. Right. I'd love being able to hit a button and getting my money back. I love it. It's fantastic. <laughs> it, it's wonderful, right? You, 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 Transparency. They, people uh, people you, don't buddy. really understand, and they've forgotten it. And uh, I, I was actually – someone told me the other day yeah. about a, a private uh, kind of uh, real estate manager that – they yeah. had assets in a private fund and a public yeah. fund, and the private yeah. fund was actually trading at a premium to the public. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, people are paying to get, get rid of their liquidity. It's insane. And, yeah. But, but, it, but if you – I mean, okay, how about I tell you this? You invest in a public uh, sector portfolio, or I can replicate private through a, a levered uh, small cap portfolio, but let's just say I do a regular one. I'm not going to mark the market for you. <laughs> And your lock, money's locked in for five years. I know. It's funny. It's almost the same return. Pro, it's probably a better return profile. Oh, it's better. So uh, Cambridge yeah. Associates did a, did a study, and they, they looked at uh, public REITs versus private real estate. Yeah. The biggest study, 900 funds. And, yeah. uh, and over 25 years, REITs up performed by 4% a year. <laughs> and, and, and you had the liquidity. Yeah. Right. So And so – there's a whole okay, so walk us through. So what do you think's happening, and when, and what, how do you think that ends? Well, it, it 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 doesn't end well when there's you know some sort of market event, right? I remember that. I mean, I'm sure you guys do too. Guys yeah. are trying to gray market their stuff because they have to mark they have to market it. Uh, they have to mark the market it in their portfolio. So they're trying to gray market it, and they don't even know what the value of it is. And then you've got right. leverage involved in private equity, and then. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a disaster if, if you don't do a proper job. Now, in, in portfolios, having direct investments um, is not – for I mean, we run some very big clients, and we have one client with $500 million of, of private assets and, and direct investments, and, and they're doing – they have a whole team looking at, the, at, at their real estate that they're doing and how they're developing. That's a whole different story. It's a whole different story. Right. Buying, then the, a pool of, then the, buying, buying a pool of mix that that 500 mix that that you know pay you hey I'm getting eight percent on that. I mean, where's the common sense? I mean, you can go get a mortgage at two or three percent. Who in the hell is paying eight? And then well, you're telling me that it's low risk on it too. Yeah. No, you're sure. absolutely right. Okay, so right. let's talk about the, the, the what you see in terms of the Canadian market, and and you know you're an energy specialist. Do you see the the energy continuing to just I don't know, like just continue to stink. Like, is there ever going to be a bottom for these energy stocks? Like I see that Eric Nuttall is probably the, the last and only remaining Canadian <laughs> energy fund left. And, yeah. and I think he yeah. said something that he might be one of only 
two global I think energy Rafia the... canoe is still doing kicking around so okay so there's one. two of them there's two of them yeah. but you know yeah. when you think back to your days when you used to cover these guys there probably was what 20 40 oh, no different... it was more it was unbelievable yeah I mean, and now there's two guys and whenever i, I hear like that kind of a million bucks a year i mean yeah. we were getting is and that wasn't just me there was a whole bunch of other guys too so it was it was but, big but when you start when you start to see you know f- you know 50 down yeah. to 2 you got to start thinking yeah. maybe there's a spot where i should be buying as a contrary you know investor well, you, could, you could have been doing that for 6 years now Okay, so right. so walk, talk. Okay. I take it by the sounds of it that you're a bear on on energy and energy stocks. Well, walk us through why okay. they're not, um, why they're a value trap, which is what I'm assuming you're gonna you're gonna say. Yeah, yeah. Because until we start to see um, fiscal spending uh, become a pervasive theme, um, that that we start to see inflation uh, creep into the market, um, these commodities are going to continue to go sideways. Right, there's day trading stuff. I mean, you can make some trades on these things. You can, you know, but the, the model is um, there are some some unbelievable value in the space. You know, you can buy some energy companies that have a you know seven six to seven percent dividend and a payout ratio of ninety percent. And I'm like, that's a great model. You need to adapt and and pay out. You know, minimize your sustaining capital, keep production flat, and pay out as much as you can do share buybacks so financial engineer yourself don't put it back in the ground so eventually there's going to be a day that there's been an uh, it'll be an, uh, uh, a supply reaction but that could be another five or six years and so okay so actually you know what would you own if you were assuming that supply reaction was sooner yeah. than you think and you were trying to find companies that you know fit your criteria that you just mentioned can you okay, name, so, give us some names okay so um um, size manufacturing low cost the sector's been disrupted so you need to own a low cost manufacturer so um you know we own suncor we own an exxon so, i mean it's not exciting but i'm getting you know six percent dividend and those things will torque I mean exxon's off 35 percent in the last 12 months so i mean from a risk reward standpoint names like those are, are good ones to own now like we view Canada, um, like so in the last ten years, I've diversified outside of, of energy. So um, it's been a good learning experience for me. So I've got as much experience outside of energy as I do within energy now, and so I've taken a lesson learned from that. And so you look at the Canadian marketplace as a whole, um, where and you can see it in the what would happen in the energy space collapse. We're a culture of complacency and a culture of entitlement. And what I mean by that is we don't know how to compete. Uh, globally, uh, we operate within oligopoly type structures, and that's energies move towards an oligopoly structure. CNQ and Suncor, Synovus, that's it, right? And then uh, CNRL. Um, within banking, you have the banks. Within telecom, you have the telecom. So the, it, the, they're not high growth stories, they're dividend type of stories, but not high growth stories. So if you want growth, you're going to have to get it outside of Canada. Okay, so you're a seller of Canada. Now, yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, listen, yeah. you mentioned something that was near and dear to my heart. You said something yeah. about the fact that uh, until we get fiscal spending, we're not going to yeah. uh, get see any inflation. And I, I 100% agree with you. Yeah. I happen to think that fiscal spending is going to be sooner rather than later. But why don't you walk me through your think? Why don't you walk me through your thinking and what you've come to terms with? Because I, I'm assuming you've realized, uh, you know, that monetary stimulus no longer works, and that fiscal is the only way to actually create the inflation that we so desperately want. 100. Uh, 100. So why, but, why, don't you, so, why don't you walk us so through your thinking? Yeah, absolutely. So. Like just putting the fiscal thing aside, monetary stimulus is driving markets, and you can see it. Like it's the, that liquidity is working its way into the S and P. When he took it away, it hurt the S and P. So if you're going to follow anything in the mar- public markets, you got to follow that. In Canada, it's funny because that monetary stimulus didn't work its way into stocks; it worked its way into housing. <laughs> yeah, I hundred percent agree. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and that's why Bank of Canada is in a really hard position because. Uh, you know, they, they they would like to lower rates, but they can't because of the housing market, and uh, and so anyway, that that's a whole different story. But looking at fiscal, where your question is, is fiscal spending. Um, so uh, because that monetary stimulus has, has not worked its way into the broader economy, right? We're not seeing um, economic benefits from that for the average person. Okay, so the gap is widening between the wealthy and the, and the poor. So in the U.S., um, 
the the, the there isn't a lot of people that own stocks per se, um, and so they haven't benefited from the rally in the, in, in the equity market. And and in Canada, there isn't a, a huge amount of people that that own house. It's actually worse in Canada because. Now you have all these speculators going crazy in housing. It's hit, you know, people who, who didn't participate in that. Um, now they, they have no affordability, and so governments are going to the governments are they're, they're pushing hard, and we can see that by who they're nominating on, uh, on on the political spectrum. So you know, guys are going more left wing. You're seeing that in the U.S. on the, on the uh, with the Democrats. You have people. You know, in Canada, you're seeing with Trudeau, he's more of an NDP than, than liberal. And so they're go, you're going to see fiscal spending get ramped up to try and help out uh, and help narrow that gap. And, uh, and, and when you look at real GDP per capita in Canada growth, it's zero, zero in the last five years. And so, you know, they're going to ramp up spending. And I think it's going to happen in, I mean, the U.S. is already doing it. Canada is going is, is to ramp it up. Uh, black zero is the big question in Germany. Is Germany? I mean, their 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 economic numbers are terrible. And, yeah, uh, it's, and their economy is in real in real trouble. And even the Schäuble, uh, who is the architect of Black Zero, has actually yeah. recently come around. Don't you think that the climate? Don't you think the climate? Whether you believe it or not, and I'm no, I don't want to get into all that stuff. But don't you yeah. think that that's going to be the excuse that they need to spend? Yeah, I do. I, I think this and, is a turnaround. Okay. And, and, and but but I, that's why I was a little bit bullish on energy starting the year because I'm like oh, I got a position around this right. Then this coronavirus thing hit, and I'm like, shit, this is not good. Um, okay, not so let's just separate that before you go on to the corona. So, yeah. uh, so you were basically positioning yourself for a reflation due to the fact that we were going to get fiscal spending. Is that correct? Yes, I was starting. I started to see some green shoots of that trade coming out, and so we started to. To pick away at, at those segments of the market that would benefit from that, and that would be energy. And, okay. Uh, and then, so and then, uh, and okay, then, and then Corona hits. So let's talk yeah. about that because yeah. so uh, the fact is that the, the market seems to be sh- like a lot of people are confused about the reaction of the market. Why don't you give us your interpretation of what's happening? No, I'm okay. Not so why, at walk all. us through. Okay, so yeah, what do you think is happening? I mean, I mean the, the market is disconnected from the economy, and and that makes okay. total sense. I mean, if you haven't got, if you haven't caught on to that, then I mean, what are you doing? Like, you, I mean, it, it's been, it's been staring you in the face for a decade. People have always been wondering. I mean, you can read Rosenberg, and he's going to tell you all of this negative economic news, and you've missed out on all of this, all of these gains. It's liquidity. It's a path of, le- path of least resistance. Liquidity, Fed liquidity. That's what's driving the market, driving equities. It's going into those. Riskier parts of the market, including equities, irregardless of the economy. And so, okay, I would actually even add that we get POBC, PBOC liquidity yeah. based on China. Would you agree? Yeah, I would agree. Right. So agree. that so your so your contention is that even though the the coronavirus might be worse than the mar- yeah. than at least it appears with the market reaction, you're not you're not confused by it because you think that this yeah. is a disconnect between uh, kind of fund- economic fundamentals and risk assets. It's going to, it's going, it's, it's actually, it's going to have a positive impact on the market because it's going to get these central so, banks to pump even more so, liquidity in the market. Right. So like who cares Martin, about the economy? It's all about liquidity in the market. Right. So how does that end? Because I mean, okay, wow. so let's, let's play the, play this. Ask, so me how, every, ask me how it ends. Like you could ask me that. Well, in no, no, but 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. But, but, 16, but let me ask you something. So, so it continues. <laughs> so it basically uh, every bad news is good news yeah. because every, uh, all bad news basically drives more liquidity and more yeah. liquidity drives stock market yeah. higher. So, so yeah. let's say then the most bullish event could be, let's say Yellowstone Park blowing up. Hey, you know what? Uh, the half of North America is covered in ash. That must be bullish because they're going to, they're going to do like, no. a big Prepper stimulus blogs. spend. Right? No, but like blogs, the so point you, is, is that you, you can make an argument that every bad news is good news because everything no, is going to no. lead to okay no, no. There's okay good, so there, there's going okay. no no so like okay okay there, maybe i'm ranting more, but give me give me a no, give i'll give me you a story. story because i'll give you a story um there's going to be something that's going to be a catalyst that is going to be that that we don't know that is going to be large enough to offset the 
the liquidity being provided by central banks. Like there's going to be something. And I don't know what it is and when it's going to happen. There's going to be something, right? And and, and maybe And so you, do you think that do you think coronavirus if it truly no. went global could be that? Well, maybe. Like but but it's it's the hard the hard point is the hard part is with with social media and connectivity, we don't know what the truth is. We really don't know what the truth is. And and so um, that that's a problem. And so I mean, I, I think I don't. I think it's going to be something that we don't see coming. So going back, um, do, do you guys know Morgan Household did a really good uh, story on this. And uh, do you guys know Morgan Household at all? Yeah, I, I follow him on Twitter. And he's, yeah, he's okay. so, a writer. Um, uh, he came out for the CFA dinner. And he told me his story. It's really cool. Do you guys know how Harry Houdini died? No. no. Did he get into no? a trap that he, he did? He get into a, a trick that he basically screwed up on. No, I mean, everyone thinks that would be it. But yeah. so he used to go around and he used to tighten his stomach up, right? And people would punch him in the gut as hard as they could. And he had this technique okay. and he could take a punch from whoever, Andre the Giant, like whatever, right? Yeah. He could take a punch. And so um, he was known for that. And so he was at a university and the student walked up and sucker punched him out of the blue. Okay. Didn't even see it coming, didn't prepare. His appendix ruptured and he died. What? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Holy yeah. smokes. Yeah. So you think the market's going to pull a Harry Houdini? I think there's going to be, like, it's not going to be trapped in a box and not getting out. It's going to be a sucker punch. Right? Oh, wow. That's true, though. That's the way, that's because it's it's what the market doesn't know, it doesn't know that's going to get it, right? Yeah. Like, it's it, because yeah. everything that we are talking about is known yeah. information and it's already yeah. being in some degree or another yeah. fully discounted into the price. Yeah. So okay, so what do you do as an investor? Well, you got a you got a risk manager portfolio, man. Like you got a, I mean, you could use options to do that. You can use uh, alternative strategies. You got to have some risk management in your portfolio. If you're just levered long, my God, I mean, it's worked out well, but there's going to be something that's going to happen. Right. Right. It's funny so, you mention it's it's funny you mention the social media though and how you don't know it's true. Like I don't know if you watch Twitter on like a Sunday. Yeah. I think Sunday is yeah. the worst day. They're all yeah. at home. And all yeah. the crematoriums, they're burning bodies in <laughs> oh, the yeah, Wu Tang yeah, yeah. province. Oh yeah. my God, I just couldn't take it. And well, the guys they've like, talked them. Driving so go ahead, trucks with big blowing steam out of there. I mean, I saw that yeah. video like ten years ago. I mean, <laughs> that was right. in China. That's right. They basically had convinced themselves. Like I was watching it the other weekend, and I think they had convinced themselves that it was going to the S and P was going to open lock limit down. Like if, if you had gone on Twitter and listened to these guys go on and, and somebody told me the other day that they said, you know, who you follow or what you see in your Twitter feed is a reflection of who you follow. And I'm like, well, I, I try to follow some bullish guys, but there doesn't seem to be anybody like it's uh, it, it, it's kind of a it's a, it's an odd thing. What do you feel about like how the world has changed in that? You know, when we you, you mentioned you were Gen X and you worked on a like a uh, investment bank and or uh, on the research side at the same time as I did in the '90s and the 2000s, and now all of a sudden, you know, we used to pass around information on trading desks, but now it's yeah. different. It's all on the on the Twitter and on the web, and it goes so yeah. fast. How do you think that's affecting markets? Oh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, well, okay, but good and bad. I mean, it's a good question. Um, it's creating more volume, more liquidity um, on that, but it's, you know, but you're not seeing it in vol, in vol either. I mean, you, I mean, vol is kind of dried up. And so I, I don't know how, it, how that, how that transcends into, into market movements. And I mean, are people actually trading on that stuff? I mean, uh, ben Hunt's got a really good uh, algorithm that, that that measures the drum beating on certain stories, and then he'll trade based on how big the how, how much noise is is being generated on a particular story or not. And you know, it, it looks like it's 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 doing some interesting things. But I think we're at the early stages of that. I don't I don't know. I mean, uh, there's there's so many people doing the same algorithms, the same quant based trading. That's what's more concerning to me. Um, and the and and the trends going more more towards hurting into those areas than anything else. 
Okay, so do you think that that's a function of like all the bridge waters and the renaissances all looking at the same factors and the fact that is that even though, you know, lots of guys get on Twitter and start talking about the end of the world and how they're burning bodies in in China, the reality is that that they're not moving the markets. Who's moving the markets are the the bridge waters. And what do you worry about with the when you see their kind of preponderance of that kind of algorithmic trading? Cuz they're not how are they going to react to a sucker punch? Okay. Right. They're all doing yeah. the same thing. And what happens when they, like, so that, that's, that's the liquidity there. Yeah, that's, that's, smart, that's smart always beta, similar. right? Smart yeah. beta. <laughs> I mean, what the hell is that? You know? Um, <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, and yeah. so, like, I like ETFs, um, but there's, there's some like, serious risks with some of the ETFs, right? And you look at the HYG, for example, high yield bond index, right? Yeah. Um, you're getting a whole bunch of inflow, and they got to buy it. They got to bid up for all these crappy bonds. But what happens if it goes the other way around? They're going to sell the most liquid ETFs first, and you're going to be left if you're not the first guy to hit sell on that HYG. And I'm picking on the HYG because it's, it's, it's kind of you know it stands out there. But or yeah. any other ETF, um, and it sells, and you're not the guy who hit the first button on the sell. What's left in your portfolio? Yeah, no, that's right. that's. That's some of the most illiquid markets out there. So, yeah. Mom, give us give us some things that you kind of are convinced the market is missing, like some ideas of 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 trends or trades or sectors or anything that you that you feel that you understand better than the market, and they're really missing this kind of opportunity. Well, I think it's the mindset of people not understanding the transition towards this internet and and and, and IOT, the, the connectivity, the Internet of Things, and 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 they're not understanding the the power of, of that and how it's influencing um, uh, consumer behavior. It's influencing uh, inflation. It's influencing business models. Um, I don't think people really have, have a, a solid understanding of that yet, um, and and the, and and its ability to scale. Um, putting like the Teslas and all that other stuff aside, but you look at like. Um, you know Costco, right? Costco yeah. makes makes all of its money off memberships, and it sells yeah, everything else is a break even, right? Yeah, well, yeah, a break even, and and so they yeah. use the other stuff, extensive capital investment to to make money off that. It took Amazon Prime, so it took uh, uh, Costco to get to to where they're at. It took them like fifteen, twenty years. It took Amazon Prime five to get to the same number. So, right. so how do you, as an investor, take advantage of that? And and is it just a matter of finding the next Amazons? No, it's not, and, and, it's not, it's no? not finding the next one because we don't know. It's looking at the existing ones and trying to get an understanding of of the model, right? Getting understanding oh, so you, of. Uh, you're arguing that those those who are thinking that that Amazon's uh, overpriced it might it actually might be cheap. Maybe, but you have to ask yourself how much of the network have they have they captured? What's can it continue to deliver? Like, so I mean, maybe there's risk on, I'm just looking at it from a different set of eyes because the traditional bricks and mortar approach is guys sticking to that value. Bricks and mortar are getting hammered and it's time to say, okay, maybe am I looking at it wrong? Is it, I mean, there are areas of the market that just don't make any sense. Like Tesla, for example. Um, but, you know, you look at the Amazon model, look at Apple, look at Apple compared to Goldman Sachs over the last decade. Um, I mean, Apple's just been astounding on what it's been able to do. And they started off with the same revenue, and now Apple's, what, 10 times bigger. So, um, and so it's the share price. So, um, you know. Uh, don't you, though, do you look at this and see shades of 99 like you were on? No, you know, no, no. no. And, and, and tell me it's why not. Okay, different. so push back against that. It's different. Smartphones. Go, go to next time you're out for dinner, or at a mall. Like, look at, look at the, look at. The, it's not just millennials. It's like Gen X and look at baby boomers. Man, they're on Facebook. Like, they're, they're, they're doing all of these. I mean, it, it's pervasive, and they're giving their data up. I mean, it's just, and and that that data is being used to do amazing, to do all kinds of interesting things that you could make money off of. So it's a loss lead model, and then they're implementing premium services, and and they're scaling out at a tremendous pace. 
and that's strictly because of of connectivity. Like it, it just like it's just nowhere in the history of mankind we're, we're, have we advanced so far in the last 15, 20 years, more so in the last decade. And it's all because we're connected, right? If you're so a young you, person. So you, sorry? Right, so you almost would, sorry, you would almost argue that all the dreams that we had in 2000, all the things that we said the internet was going to do, yeah. it actually has come true today, not 20 years ago. Yeah. It's because of connectivity. We were too early in 2000. Right? Like, right. look at the data, the amount of data that's being created now because of that connectivity. Everything is connected. Just think about, look, watch around you. Look, I mean, look at, uh, at, 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 look at Netflix. Uh, I actually had the, my most successful tweet ever. I had a retweet by The Rock. I had like 500,000 hits to my website. Thank you, Rock. Thank Come you. Come on, really? Austin. The Rock? Yeah, I did. The Rock? <laughs> yeah. Well done. And, and, and I, I said, was like, you know, um, he, he made a movie with Ryan Reynolds, a $123 million movie on Netflix. And I quoted that and I said, you know, blood, sweat, and respect the first two you give, the last two you get. And, and, and it's the point is that it's, it's like The Rock made a movie for $120 million on Netflix. Right? Right. Like it, so the world's it, changed, basically, is what you're arguing. And the, and the, and the too many people are stuck on stuck on old ways of thinking. Then you're looking at bricks and mortars, and you're saying, well, you know how like look at the revenue of this versus the revenue of this versus the market cap. But you know the revenue of ones having the ARR, at, you know, is doubling every year. Look at compounding. Like just look at simple compounding at five yeah. or six percent. You start running numbers at twelve to twenty or thirty percent ARR. I mean, I mean, you're paying a, a, you know, a multiple. Like, what's the multiple of that, right? Okay, so let's think about you're you're an investor. You're sitting there and you're trying to yeah. figure out where to put your money. What do you do? Yeah. Like, you know, obviously everybody's different, but there must be some things yeah. that that in general you point them to. Why don't you walk us through just kind of some of your bigger themes that you feel are are applicable in this environment? Okay, so you need active managers in inefficient markets like Canada, like and and other markets like 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 in maybe emerging markets or other where there's you know an ability to add uh, add value uh, by doing thorough research and identifying you know Canada Shopify's the world right? Um, right. There isn't very many of them, but you know doing some doing some work from that standpoint is important. In the S and P 500, um, this is where it gets really tricky. Uh, the, those four stocks, the M A G A, Mick American Great again, is what Trump said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, those four stocks have contributed to sixty percent of the returns in the S and P. It's crazy. And so yeah, right. so I mean, if you're an active, and they're manager, only a, they're a fi- they're a fifteen percent weighting in the index, but they've contributed like half the gains. It's like sixty yeah. percent this year. They're seventy five percent, and and so if you're a stock if you're a stock picker in the U S. and you don't have that in your portfolio. I mean, your results are terrible. So, you know, and I, I like all of those companies. I really do. And so owning, but I don't know which one's better than the other. It's just, uh, and and so I own passively the S&P. It's really simple, but it works. It works great. And then, you know, I look at from a risk parity approach, um, uh, I want to own lower correlated assets. So I, I do like uh, the Bridgewater, um, not to their extreme, but I do like uh, risk parity. I do like having some, you know, treasuries in the portfolio. I do like, and that's been very beneficial for us. I do like having, um, you know, uh, a little bit of commodities in, in the portfolio. I do like having some real estate in the portfolio. Um, so it's not rocket science, but um, I, I am not making, I'm not making big calls on any particular segment of the market, but um, I'm constructing a portfolio that is, Based on different weights can get me different target returns and minimize the the vol, and that's so, all I care about. I really want to minimize that uh, that vol because, I mean, if you, if you don't minimize that vol, there's a great. Uh, I wrote a, re, uh, a report on it and uh, or a column on it, and it's called pattern of returns. And you can have two portfolios with exactly the same return, but dramatically different outcomes. So like two million dollars with a hundred grand a year draw. Um, you know, ending at four million and one ending at seven hundred grand, simply because of the pattern of the vol. And so, yeah. you know, 
constructing a portfolio like this is this is good old fashioned portfolio management that this is the value of having an advisor do that work for you or if you can try to do it yourself if you've got the capabilities to yeah. but it's really managing that ball um, and not concerning yourself whether you should own an overweight at Microsoft or underweight at Apple. Yeah. So listen, we're slowly running out of time, but I had to squeeze in the question beforehand is uh, your views on the uh, Canadian dollar as a fellow Canadian because uh, yeah. obviously uh, the, the, that's a big portfolio decision, especially yeah. for a lot of people. So how much do you weigh yourself in, in a domestic currency? Uh, oh. But uh, what's, uh, what's your, uh, what's your uh, opinions on this? Well, we're underweight Canada, so that means we have more USD, um, and that's been okay. Um, until that fiscal, like that trade that we talked about, starts to kick in, um, we're a petrol currency. There's n- I don't care what you say, we are a petrol yeah. currency. And until we start to see a rebound in those commodities, we're going to see, see it muddle along. The reason why the Canadian dollar has held up so long is because of the Bank of Canada. It's taken a, a much more conservative approach with rate cuts than other yeah. other G7s nations, and so that's been very supportive to the, to the dollar. Um, but if you look at productivity, I don't think we as a nation at fifty dollar oil can compete against the U.S. Um, uh, at much higher than seventy five cents. It just doesn't work. We could get a to right. par, but the oil's got to be there. We just don't have the we don't have the productivity. I mean, there's all kinds of reports, even. Uh, what's her name, Wilkins? I mean, she had said that uh, that our productivity is lagging the U.S. I mean, hello. I mean, that's that's yeah. been the story for so long, and and you can see that in the companies that we uh, that we create, um, we just don't know how to compete, and uh, because right. because if we use regu- protective regulation and we keep companies like Bombardier and S and C Labland in power uh, or in, in business when they should be put, you know, uh, we should let the market do what it's going to do. Okay, Martin, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Before we leave, I always like to ask our guests one last thing, and it's uh, if you could go back and talk to the Martin of 20, 30 years ago, what advice would you give him? Play the long game. Uh, Play the long game. Play the long game. Um, When you're young, you're you're only looking at one week at a time. Um, You know, play the long game. There's a great book uh, by James Clear, Atomic Habits, and and so I really recommend it. And what it does is you're you're trying to change a habit or a particular goal, or reach a particular goal, but you're not making big changes. You're doing small daily changes, and it's so it's, it's becoming a habit. So if I went to myself. I would say, okay, um, you know, I mean, it was so exciting being in the energy space, um, and it was a great place to be, but. Um, you know, I would tell myself to say, okay, what's the, what is this sustainable? Ask myself, am I thinking differently about this? Um, you know, and, and how can I reposition? And if I did that, and I think more people did that in Calgary or in Alberta, I think the province would be in a much different position. Hmm. Well, that's some great advice. Martin, where can people find more about you and your firm if they want to learn about you? Uh, you can look me up on LinkedIn um, or our website, www.trivestwealth.com. Uh, we just did a big merger, so the website will still be live and forwarded on to a new site eventually, but uh, that's the best way, to, uh, best way to reach us. Well, thank and, you so much for your time. And you can also follow you on Twitter, right? you got a good uh, oh. Twitter feed. Out yeah, we, yeah I, 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 have a little bit of, I have a little bit of fun. Um, my, uh, um, yeah, absolutely, you can, you can find well, me. Well, The Rock on, follows you. Well, no, he doesn't follow me. He just retweeted me. Uh. So, uh, no, that's a yeah, no, that's a. I, I did try and uh, that, I, I can't push my luck. I got I got one and that's one and done. So, uh, yeah, my Twitter handle is okay. at m pelche c i o for chief investment officer. All right, great. Well, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Have a great weekend. You too, guys. All right, thanks a lot, Martin. All right, so joining us now for uh, the regular monthly segment of Navigator Launch is our good friend, Tony Greer. How you doing, buddy? I'm great, Patrick. How are you today, man? Oh, I'm doing great. It's uh, crazy markets, isn't it? It's just uh, amazing to see that it doesn't matter what bad news you throw at the market, it just keeps going higher, right? Yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, we haven't, <laughs> we haven't, traded, we haven't traded through a, a global pandemic since 2003. And, uh, you know, some of that muscle memory is coming back. And, uh, you know, the S&P will definitely be the last one to give in 
and uh, yeah. you know buck, buckle in some way at least due to this coronavirus. Apparently, apparently. What is? But what is? Isn't it interesting that when uh, when SARS was around and in two thousand three, the market was at the end of a bear market, and now we're at the uh, arguably I don't want to say the top of a bull market because we don't know whether it's officially ended. But it's uh, but it seems like the market is at a completely opposite um, spectrum of where it was. So it's hard to use that as a reference, right? Uh, yeah, I totally agree, Patrick. There's a, you know, there's a dynamic right now where, you know, you face, you face literally, you know, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of the litmus tests that I put on for trades that uh, I got from Dave Collum, my friend um, up at Cornell University. And it's like, literally, will I be furious with myself, you know, when I look back on this, if I didn't put this trade on type of thing, you know, and, I, and now I, you know, I look back at this and it's like, am I going to be furious at myself? that the coronavirus broke out in China. I knew they were giving us false information and I didn't sell all my stocks because they never went down fast enough, you know, and then all of a sudden it's too yeah. late. So, you know, that that's the dilemma that, you know, we're all living through right oh, now. Everybody, sure. Everybody's claiming to be long with a tight stop and, you know, the stop is a tight stop until they all go at once, right? Right. And the liquidity event uh, proves that your stop yeah. is much lower than you thought. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Your fill is 20 percent lower than what you anticipated. Exactly. So what, what's uh, what are you watching nowadays? Uh, I, I mean, I've been I've been playing crude oil and writing about crude oil from the long side down here. Um, I feel like uh, I think it's a good risk reward trade, if nothing else. You know, if you look at you've got the chart up there, you know, we've had a couple yeah. of bottoms around fifty dollars. Um, and the theme that I've been writing about in my note is that, you know, the, the oil market is balanced. And I said that before, you know, the attack on the Abcake facility in Saudi Arabia. Um, I'm saying that here in, in sort of what this period of what we'll call what we know about the coronavirus. Um, and I, I think that all of the bad news has been thrown at the oil market and the commodities market that they can see in the short term. So um, and I only like it because the risk reward lines up on the charts. You know, I can stop out somewhere, you know, reasonably below fifty dollars if crude oil spends much time down there. But I don't think it's going to. You know, the situation continues to happen in crude oil where, you know, we the, the either the price rallies on some kind of a shortage and then it's brought back to life by, you know, the reality of there being plenty of inventory or. You know, we've got a dip right now, you know, because we've got a demand, a lack of demand destruction, uh, excuse me, a demand destruction dip. Right. And then um, my, my bet is that, you know, there'll either be a supply disruption or people will start buying it for the value, uh, you know, of buying oil down yeah. here or all of the bad news in the coronavirus is out at the moment. And, or at least all the bad news that the market is going to listen to is out. So I feel like there's a good chance for short term, not a huge payout trade, but a good risk reward. And that's where my chips are right now. I've got some oil. I've got some oil calls and I've got some a uh, few oil single name stocks, some refineries. And, and that's it. But I've been writing about it in my note. And uh, so far, so good, man. So listen, uh, when you're using your moving averages, you have we have the 50, uh, 100, and 200 day moving averages on here. Is yeah. is your short term targets as uh, the as oil approaches those levels? Is that uh, the way you'd look at where where the the short term bounce can head up to? Yeah, for me, Patrick, this is a super short term trade. Like I've got I've got um, you know like hair on you know, like um, a position size that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. So you know all of the bounces that occur in the things that I'm long right now, I'm a seller of. You know, so it's right. kind of like I've I've established my position, I placed my bet, and now I'm just going to let the market take it away from me. I mean, I don't think this is going to last more than maybe two weeks or something like that. But to me, you know, in crude, the, it's funny you mentioned the moving averages because recently in crude oil, for me, those have been providing where value is for crude oil, right? Like those have been, right. uh, you know, the mean. And if you want to, you know, sort of keep sit on your hands while it's sitting in that range and then, you know, be short above that range and long below that range in some capacity, you know, when it feels safe, uh, that's been a great trade for me. So I'm going to keep doing it until I get completely fried. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, what, are there any other commodities that you're keeping an eye on or uh, currency markets or anything? Uh, bonds? What's uh, what's on your mind? Yeah, you know, I'm, I, I am. I'm watching the base metals, you know, because they're going to be an indicator. They they've uh, were the first ones to take it on the chin. You know, when the virus came out, copper went straight down. 
Um, the problem with trying to play copper is that the copper market's also balanced and the price range is balanced. You know, you look at copper, me, LME copper is 550 bid at 650. Um, uh, Comex copper is probably, what is it, 250 bid at three bucks is the equivalent or so. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and no matter what, you know, like we said, same thing as crude oil. It gets, it doesn't get going on the upside and there's no follow through on the downside. So that's why it's been difficult to try to place bets in base metals, but I'm kind of just watching them for directional indicators. And I see, you know, they, they've been telling a sort of truer story about this virus than the stock market has, in my opinion. So, you know, we'll see how long the stock market rally lasts and if it doesn't come back to earth, you know, um, somewhere sensibly into the moving averages. But it's still a bull are you, market. Are, are you trading any of the copper stocks? Because it's interesting that like Freeport and Southern, they haven't remotely broken as badly as copper itself has. Oh. Uh, how Do you have any opinions on that? No, no, Patrick. Those are like I said, those are like range bound. There's not enough volatility right now. There's not enough yeah. reason to place a, a big bet in any of those names. You know, I don't I don't you know, those are the names you play when there's a sort of, you know, maybe a supply deficit in copper that you think the stock hasn't seen coming yet or something like that. You know, right now, there's really nothing interesting there for me. All right. How about gold? Any any thoughts on what's going on there? Gold is a sort of, you know, I keep calling gold the feed up on the desk trade. You know, like it's like you've got to you've got to be long it. You can't be too long that it's going to hurt you if it if it dislocates because it's a very popular trade. But I think you can be patient because gold has shown that it can go up in two different scenarios. And that's really important to me. You know, when we were in that um, huge bond bubble last summer, gold was roaring because the negative rate pool was huge. Um, and now gold is firming up because all the central banks in the world are adding to their balance sheet and diluting their currency. So gold is kind of just looking over and saying, yeah. Uh, yeah, there are 20 central banks on the planet easing right now. Gold is going to remain bid. You know, right. and and uh, so that's just how I'm looking at it. And uh, yeah, I, I the, this one thing that uh, I think is important that people in the market, uh, you know, long term holders of gold have an interesting perspective. And some of them that have it, you know, for the doomsday scenario. Um, and I, I was just having a conversation with some people that sort of are holders of gold for the doomsday scenario for a currency devaluation, um, you know, an absolute financial panic and stuff like that. And I, I sort of wanted to remind them that you're not going to be able to use or sell your gold in the event of a panic, right? Like gold right. is going to be utterly, utterly useless, right? Like if you have large blocks of it, you can't carry it around. You can't bring it somewhere. Nobody's exchanging gold for, for food or medicine, you know, in a, in a financial catastrophe. In fact, the price of gold might not even be going up anymore because what happens in financial catastrophe is people that are over levered have to just sell their position. So if people are levered long gold waiting for this, they're going to be sellers of gold when a catastrophe hits. And I think people forget that, that uh, you know, if they've never lived through scenarios like that, that that's one of the dynamics where gold is not a great doomsday play. Can you not make that same argument for real estate or anything else? Like these assets just won't be liquid during those scenarios, right? Like uh, everyone who, who thinks they've got some sort of value uh, put aside in that, that those assets are going to be very illiquid in, in oh, those totally. periods when you need the liquidity, right? Totally, man. I mean, I don't have any experience with a real, you know, financial system coming apart or panic, but we lived through the great financial crisis and, you know, had a, had a sort of whiff of what that might have felt like, um, you know, had things gotten terribly worse and we didn't rescue the, um, you know, the investment banks, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, and, and that's another scenario where that's, you know, with when, where doom is coming, you know, people are going to have to sell all their levered positions. And if gold's one of them, gold's going to get sold along with the stocks. Right. So right. that's just how I, that's just how I look at it. You have, do you have any thoughts on stocks and bonds at all? What, any opinions on, uh, on uh, how to put on some trades there? I mean, I'm long. I'm, I've been bullish stocks. I, you know, I took, I, you know, took a quick breath, um, you know, when the coronavirus hit, just like everybody else, and looked at it and said, okay, like, yeah, you can look at it right there. You saw the volatility. We didn't even pierce a moving averages, a moving average, and the market was as soon it was back, as soon as it was back up above 32.80 for me. You know, that said, okay, it, it, it was the the market decided that the coronavirus was not a big enough event. Now, you know, yeah. there there may be more 
more damage than the market expected coming down the road and things could change. So we always have to think, you know, freely. Um, but right now the bull market is prevailing. You know, people at FinTwit are still throwing eggs at it. Nobody, nobody <laughs> can embrace it. You know, meanwhile, you look at Fang, F Patrick, I don't know if you can call it Fang, but Fang is one yeah, of like yeah, the yeah. most, it's like one of the most bullish charts that I've seen. If you've got like a 10 year chart on Fang, um, you know, the Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix. Well, this is the, uh, this is the, uh, that Fang plus index future that I've got up here. Oh, okay. But I mean, well, it's still, it's still, it's still going to give you that, but, that. Yeah, yeah. Look at it. Ooh, look at it on a long term chart. Does it have a ten, a ten year chart? Yeah, even a uh, weekly. No, is fine. Yeah, no. The, it's going to two thousand eighteen for this one. Oh, but still. Uh, okay. If you, if you, yeah, put it this way, I could probably send it to you real quick. But if you looked at a quick Fang chart over, and I'm talking about Facebook, Apple, yeah. Netflix. Google, you know, the thing rallied for 10 years from 2008, essentially, you know, would have rallied if it was it was yeah. put together. Then. I mean, you it, know, it, it rallied for 10 years and then it consolidated from 2018 to 2019 and then just broke its new high um, through 4000, you know, after failing it three times. And like, I wouldn't be short that for, you know, with all the money in the world. You know, I can flip that chart to you right here if you want to put that yeah, up. Yeah. Screen. So, um it just shows you how it's been trending for a long time and, and, uh, and, you know, then consolidated and keeps going. So th that's, what's driving the market. You know, people want to hate it and people want to throw eggs at it. But the reality is, is, you know, it's a new, it's a new earnings paradigm for some of the FANG stocks. And it, it seems like that is just going to continue now. I don't know what stops it, Patrick. I really don't. Eventually, <laughs> it'll just get, eventually it'll just get too overowned by every passive ETF and there'll be no buyers left. Well, I mean, that's that, isn't that really the case, right? Like, which is essentially at, at this moment, you almost have had no performance. Uh, here's that chart you were sending. So, like, you had no performance uh, um, if you basically, or very low performance if you did not have exposures to the Fang. Like, they've they've been the leadership, the, yeah. the generals that have been driving this market higher. And so, totally. with this breakout, they it's uh, it, managers are, are chasing performance for career risk, right? Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, you know, people want to say people want to take shots at fading it, you know. And then we have a month like January where the subsectors of tech all ripped, you know, from internet stocks, social media, um, cybersecurity. Um, you know, they all there were a couple of sectors where where's my people? My, they were six percent. Hold on, I got it right here. Sorry. Yes, yeah, software and cloud were up, you know, over six percent in January. Subsectors of tech. So, like, when those feel like they've got, you know, young and fresh money coming into them, that's not something that I want to fade. You know, so right. this, this seems like this can go on, you know, this year certainly. And if we're going to have this Pomo, you know, liquidity available for anyone that needs it, no matter what their levered position is, and people don't have to worry about leverage for a little while, then again, this is going to continue for a lot longer. And so, you, and you think that this could, uh, irrespective of the coronavirus, you think that this can just, uh, or is that something that could uh, could uh, accelerate this to potentially turn sooner, right? Like, well, I mean, it, 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 yeah, yeah. At some at some level, you know, at some level, the coronavirus is sort of, you know, um, you know, a call on on if you whether how much you believe the Chinese Communist Party right now. You know, it's like, you know, er, er, yeah, you know, early on they were they were, you know, coming down hard on that doctor um, who passed away and, you know, accusing him of potentially spreading rumors. And then the guy winds up dying and, and he's really, truly become a hero. And, um, you know, the, the, the picture that they sold us was totally false. So maybe the picture that they're selling selling us now is totally false. You know, the people that are in the know are looking at the fact that there are signs, you know, if you look at heat maps of China, there are signs that there's, you know, burning of organic substances around Wuhan. And, you know, the the theory is, is that they could be burning more dead bodies so that they don't have to, you know, announce how many people have died. And as gory as as difficult as that is to discuss, if that becomes true and this virus starts spreading, you know, um, across countries, Global. yeah, yeah, then it's of course, then then the world is going to have to listen because then the, the data is really going to filter out. But it seems yeah. to be very localized at the moment in terms of how the market perceives it. You know, if you look at the currency market, the yuan is, you know, really really struggling now, and it's weighing on all the EM currencies and weighing on the Aussie dollar. 
you know, and even weighing on the euro, for God's sakes, you know, the euro hasn't picked its head up since the coronavirus um, came out. And that that literally that's a pool of weakness. I think you're low on the euro. Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, we we got a euro that l- looks like it uh, is uh, falling off the edge of a cliff down to those uh, uh, multi-year lows near uh, 105. It like does. Uh, it, it does. I don't think we're going to accelerate down here, though. I really don't. I would, I would, it's oversold. You know, yeah, I think it's oversold, it's and like I think I know oil. why. I mean, I think I know why. You know, the euro just broke above its 200-day moving average there on a really serious string of positive economic data. Right. If you look, you know, if you look at the city economic surprises index for Europe, that thing went bonkers for like three months and the euro started rallying. Rates were going higher. People were piling into European stocks and it caught everybody off sides in European in European central uh, center. If you know what I'm saying, Patrick, you know, specifically in Europe, you know, that's what was playing out. And everybody just had to say, oh, man, all right, everything we just bought is now for sale. Right from the euro to the euro stocks to the European banks, right across the line, you know, and everything like that. So I think that that seems to tell the story of this, you know, overblown scenario. And that's what happens now when you've got high frequency traders in the currency market. You know, if they weren't yeah. around, the dip probably would have stopped at you know a buck ten and a half, but now it's down at one oh eight and a half because they smell the sellers. <laughs> that's that's for sure. You know? that's for sure. Anyway, so uh, why don't you tell uh, all of our listeners where they can uh, follow your work and uh, get a, subsc- uh, a, a trial subscription? Yeah, man. Um, you can get a tr- you can sign up for a trial at tgmacro.com, the homepage of my website. Um, you can find me on Twitter at tgmacro. Um, the Morning Navigator subscriber base is uh, happy and growing, and um, it feels pretty good right now for the year in 2020, so I'm excited. All right. Well, Tony, thanks so much uh, for joining us and uh, we'll uh, see you next month. Yeah, Patrick. Thanks for having me, my man. Have a great weekend. All right. Take care, buddy. Okay, Patrick. It's my favorite time talking charts. And I, I hear you got something. You got a bone to pick with me about some of these charts. Oh, yeah. Well, let's talk. To, but first of all, this uh, segment is uh, uh, brought to you by and we will be using the Coif and Charts. Uh, just a great platform. You know, I, I personally don't use a Bloomberg. You do. And uh, and so whenever I, I'm looking for some of these factor analysis and all sorts of other really neat things, what a great resource this is. And so uh, let's uh, jump to these charts. And uh, well, I have here the S&P 500 and uh, I just uh, wanted to start off by just uh, looking at just this trend that seems unbreakable. I mean, the moment that coronavirus came about, the market took a a quick little dip down uh, and barely uh, approaching a 100 point sell off. And then immediately the dip was bought and took off. Right. Right. And uh, when it did. Obviously, there was a number of uh, high uh, high tech names, including Tesla, that were running right. And Tesla seems to have really uh, run its course, uh, at least on the short term. I mean, I'm, I don't already want to put a nail in the coffin because this thing could easily still run. But one of your arguments was that, uh, in, in addition to the fact that there was this gamma squeeze and short squeeze that started early, right. that the ESG buying was was uh, dr- uh, adding and contributing. Contributing to this is right. that? Am I misinterpreting? No, it? you're not misinterpreting it. That's definitely correct. And, and so you're saying that you know that there's a bottleneck on this. And so I wanted to kind of look at it, and, and I, I was like thinking, well, how much in a in a standard ESG ETF is Tesla a major component of it? Uh, and this is where I wanted to push back on you because if money flow is going into these ESG uh, ETFs, I'm going to use ESGU as an example. I'm just going to go to holdings, right? And, like Tesla, you have to scroll down and down and down to get – and I mean what is it, like a 0.5? Where the heck is this thing? Uh, but okay, you, uh, go ahead and uh, while okay, I find so it, you, back. The, do the pushback on what. So there's no doubt, and I've been getting some flack you for this. You're not alone. Um, a lot of people have been telling me that. Uh, Point four waiting, and I had, I had to scroll for an hour to, find, <laughs> to get down to its holdings yeah, there. No hyperbole there. <laughs> Uh, okay, so you had to scroll for an hour to find out that Tesla is very low down the, the ESGU right. holding. A lot of people have been pushing back on me and saying the first of all, if you look at Tesla, the G portion, which is governance, is terrible. Right. Like there's no almost no worse stock. The guy is high half the time that he's tweeting and, and doing yeah. stuff and um, meaning the CEO and uh, 
it ends up being that there's no way that this could be they, they are they argue that there's no way that the ESG could be pushing this. Now, I will agree with you that ESG, I have conflated both ESG and all let's just call it alternative energy companies. Mm-hmm. And I lumped them together and they probably shouldn't be. They probably truly should be separated. Right. ESG is a movement that is designed to go and um, let's just put it, uh, analyze different companies for their kind of benefit or harm to society. So, and and there's no doubt that when I said that people are chasing Tesla because of the ESG movement, that I was probably mixing up ESG with alternative energy. Fair enough. And I will and give so, you that. But, but So now there was also an argument that you made uh, yeah. that um, that there could be an ESG bubble. Did you not? Like that, yeah. There, that, that and again, I would probably – Again, I think I... You're going to talk it back? Well, (laughs) no, I'm not going to talk it back. I still think these things are going, and I think there's a lot of stocks like that. And I contend that if you are an investor or a portfolio manager that is buying stocks and for an investor that is sensitive to the environment, I... Like, I, I don't pull back my argument that they own Tesla. So maybe you're right. Maybe the ones that are running proper ETFs are not buying it. Yeah. But anybody that is running an ESG mandate is uh, is probably so, overlooking the governance and sticking tons of Tesla in it. It's the only car company that is, you can truly call alternative. So so what I wanted to point out, uh, which was a, an, an, an interesting observation I, I, I made. So I went and looked. OK, so this this is the ESGU. And like, look at the top four holdings. It's the MAGA stocks. Yeah. Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google. But more importantly, look at its weighting. 5%, 5%, 3%, 2%, 15% of this is in the, in the MAGA stock, right? So you take the SPY and you look at what are the top four holdings in, in the SPY, right? It's your, pretty much your MAGA stocks. Facebook jumped a little bit higher, but then you go 5%, 5%, 5% 3%, 2%. Basically, uh, the ESG ETF has the same MAGA stock weighting uh, of the top stocks. And then, so when you take the performance, and so let's just say the ESGU, and we basically look at uh, the um, uh, uh, performance chart, and you just overlay it with... By the way, you're becoming a Coifin expert there, by the way. Oh, thank you, sir. It's thank actually- you. And so let's just say I, I added uh, on top of this the SPY, right, just the, for the S&P 500. I mean... Yeah. The, no, I listen. The, 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 I, you're this, not, you're, you're, an ESGU bubble is a SPY bubble. Okay. Right now, that ESGU is probably not the correct ETF for me to to, to, to get to get your idea across. Yeah, right? Okay, fair enough. And and one of the things that I would argue is that I was trying to just show that instead of buying tons of spies, they're increasingly buying ESGU, yeah. and it was just indicative of this trend towards this type of investing. Mm-hmm. And I could name you a whole bunch of other stocks that have just run like nobody's business. That you know, Ballard Power. You yeah. know, Brookfield uh, Renewables Partners. There is a huge, huge interest in alternative clean technology. Yeah. And, and and that trend is not going away. And there's more of it every single day. Yeah. And so if, I, I overlaid the cues on there and just showing that really – uh, the outperformance continues to be in in the uh, the Nasdaq technology names like the ESG versus the S and P are mirroring, and it's really the Nasdaq that's separating. Yeah. And uh, and that and so I I just all I'm saying is that like you know I, I like your little ESG story, but I don't think it's as big of a factor as as uh, as you're making well, it out. Well, I be. I still think that that was one of the biggest pushes for Tesla. I know I'm getting a lot of kind of flack for that call. I yeah. I don't. I am not taking it back. You haven't convinced me. <laughs> I think the reality is that if once he showed that he could build a factory and accomplish it in China and kind of the worry came off, any in portfolio manager with any sort of like ESG kind of bend to him or her would be forced to buy Tesla. Yeah. And I don't – although I understand that retail played a role and, and there's no doubt the gamma – accelerated it to the upside. I don't think that that sort of move happens without big players buying it. It's a big stock. It's it, it, like if it was a cheap little crappy biotech stock that you could move around with retail money, I would agree with you, but this is a big stock. This was basically Nortel again, 
20 years later yeah. and it was that every manager felt like they have to own it because all of a sudden it became the go-to name for clean energy car company. All like, right. What are you going to buy? You're going to buy you're going to buy uh like uh, Ford? You you have to buy Tesla. All right. Well, listen, you are uh, I think we'll leave it at that. I just I wanted to kind of just uh, voice my opinion on the correlation there. But the, what I want to move on to now is you you were uh, playing this idea of going long euro stock against a um, uh, a short Nasdaq. So Patrick is and talking charts now, just like you taking sh- shots. Take, at all I'm my, taking shots at, at you, buddy. Every post oh, no, no. But listen, I, I I no. I just want to better understand this. Is, I, I'm done taking shots. The, my, <laughs> the, right? the okay. ESGU is my little taking shots. But uh, but the thing is, is that. Look, I'm, I actually have a, a – I believe that currency plays an important part uh, as a tailwind or a headwind to a stock market. And in my opinion, the fact that the euro has been in a free fall I think has played an important role in contributing to the recent – pop in the euro stock that's my theory and i want to hear your opinion on this i i 100 agree with you so so if you continue to believe the euro stock is going to outperform and it's a good long against the nasdaq short is that you admitting that you and a copy are going to be wrong and owe me stakes and uh and that the euro is heading down to 105 or lower is this where we're going with this conversation no so i i i <laughs> No, I don't. No, I, so you then you're not. So you don't think the euro stock is going to outperform? No, I don't think them. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. <laughs> I do agree with you that that it helps. It's a tailwind at their back. Yeah, and that there there is a good argument to be made that the recent breakout was the result of the currency going right. down. I think it's a pretty funny that um, this recent breakdown in the currency was triggered by the idea that Lagarde was speeding up the ECB's. I don't know, decade-long review or whatever it was. And this is what I think the market is missing, Patrick. They assume that Lagarde is going to do more monetary ease. They somehow think that that speeding up means that there's going to be lower rates. I contend that they understand that lower monetary rates hurts them and that what we are going to see is an increasing fiscal Right. And when they do fiscal, what you're going to get is actually the stock market stronger, the bond market weaker, and believe it or not, the currency higher. That's my contention. I think it'll be just like when Trump went so, and so cut what, taxes and did fiscal. We got stock market stronger, dollar stronger, bonds weaker. It'll be the same trade. All right. Well, listen, we'll have a conversation about this when Cuppy's on in a couple of weeks. And, and so let's not uh, let's not go any further on this. On Having said that, you're right. It looks like shit. Like the, the currency looks no, like no, there's no No, no. Let's just save it. I'm not, let's not even say anything else. Let, this is, okay. we're, we're good. We're good. So what I wanted to, though, uh, jump to the yield curves for a moment because the yield curves have been a, a, a bit of a muddle. Uh, and what what uh, we obviously talked about the fact that the Canadian yield curve was uh, was some, one of the most inverted. But I want to just stay it's the focused. only inverted one, bud. It's only inverted one, and uh, and um, what I wanted to do just go to the U.S. right, and I wanted to focus on uh, just the two tens because that's the traditional one everyone watches, right? And what I wanted to I, I can't believe it's yellow, but anyway, whatever you have to. Anyway, the point being here is is that. That we've had a little backing up. We had a steepener and a backup. Now, what I find interesting is when you go back like 10 years to the last time we had um, – the, oh, yeah, let me go longer term. Last time we had these inversions, we had one dip down. It kind of bounces and then – breaks back down and inverts a second time or stays inverted a second time and it stays there for a year or more. Are you in the camp that we stay with a flat curve here or do you think that in general that the steepening is something that is in our imminent uh, future as in like the in the first half of this year we're going to start seeing more steepening? So I think that the Fed used to play by a book that they would raise rates, raise rates, raise rates till they broke something. Right. And that's why you got what you saw because they would keep raising rates and eventually they would cause the economy to fall off the cliff yeah. and then they would have to lower rates very quickly and then the curve would, would take off. Yeah. It's, I hate to say this and I, I you know, I, I'm hesitant to let these <laughs> words come out of my mouth. Because you know I'm looking for something. This time is different. <laughs> and. <laughs> No, we I should do. make that the slogan of the show. Yeah, I actually, 
<laughs> I hate saying it, but it is. And 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 you know, I I'll go to the, I'll use the Keynes line. Keynes line. Uh, you know, when the facts change, so do I. I think that central banks have changed their playbook, and that we're no longer on at the same sort of. Uh, rule book that we used to use and the reality is that i think that they're showing you that they're going to let this thing run hot so the only way that i would contend that you would be correct is if all of a sudden the powell of old that was worried about the bubbles in the finance financial markets came back and he was intent on slowing the economy or at least steepening the uh fl- flattening and, and raising rates at the short end because he was worried that there's bubble being created in the securities market. Right. And if that was the case, if he was worried about the, the what was so happening. Do, do we st- get to 1% here? Do you think we, we, uh, what do you we mean? Like this curve gets steep. Yeah. 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 I, I, I still think this is the trade. Yeah. I, I don't. And I think if it goes back down, you just buy it again. Like it's, it's something you just, no, there was a, there was an, uh, a, uh, um, Albert Edwards piece, which of course is like a, a perma bear, but I mean they were they were talking about a, a, in in still a deflationary impulse. Before, first of all, he has has written already about the fact that he does believe that um, that that monetary stimulus uh, in fiscal spending is coming. So he accepts that to be true, and, and he thinks that it will change the regime. But he believes that it still ends with a deflationary impulse, and he's still calling for negative. Of ten-year yields in in, in the U.S. Yeah. and so so uh, so you you're a seller on the deflation in, uh, impulse. Thing? Yeah, no, I love Albert. Like I think I, he, he anybody that's willing to laugh at himself and poke fun at himself. Like I think he said something like I've called ten uh, ten of the last two crashes. <laughs> anybody that has the self awareness to kind of make fun of himself like that is a is a plus in my book. Super nice guy, great writer, really entertaining. Yeah. I I love him to death. I read him all the time. Do I agree with this thesis? No, I, I I don't think it's coming. I think that the surprises over the next decade or two are going to be on the other side. They're going to be with inflation, not deflation. There you go. You you heard it from Kevin here. So I think uh, I think that's where we can uh, wrap up uh, this segment. It, it was uh, uh, thanks to Coifin for uh, uh, that great platform. Uh, it's great to go through all the charts. Yeah. Okay, Patrick, this week in trading history, what do you got for us? All right. Well, this week in trading history, I wanted to go back to the pets.com IPO. But really, uh, this, okay, we, there, there's always this history. There's no shortage of companies out there to talk about their boom bust cycles, and not everyone's worth talking about. But there's a particular thing about the pets.com story that I that appeals to me. But anyway, let's first it, go it, through. Well, listen, it was the poster child of the dot com bubble. It was. Right? Like when people talk about the dot com bubble, you know, maybe Cisco would be the, the one that, that the institutional bigger people would know. Yeah. But for retail, this was the one that really just kind of Absolutely. exemplified the, the bubble. So let's kind of go through some of the facts. So it was on February 11th of the year 2000. Uh, so just at the, the start of the new uh, millennia, um, you had the pets.com IPO occur at $11 a share. And um, it would uh, trade uh, over the that first few trading sessions up to $14 a share before it collapsed. But the, it was epic, the rate of its collapse. It didn't stay, uh, uh, it didn't survive even a year. Yeah, and it came out at the very top of the market. Right. I think it missed it by, what, a month? Yeah. Was it the top in March? Yeah, so it, was. it was something crazy like that. So let's go through the thing. So first of all, interesting fact, Kev, Amazon.com, was involved in Pets.com's first round of venture funding and purchased a majority 54% stake in the company. I did not know that. So so Amazon actually, uh, while it survived and went on to delivering much much of the dog food people need in the future, it didn't do so with its Pet.com brand. I did not know that. Yeah, so, uh, so during the fiscal year, uh, it earned uh, it, in the prior fiscal year. It earned six hundred thousand dollars in revenue. That's it. Just six hundred thousand. Not even a million, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, can you imagine like uh, WeWorks or something like that, and not even having a mill revenue? Like yeah. six hundred thousand revenue, and it spent about twelve million dollars in advertising. So it was <laughs> it was running like super hot, right? And uh, and what was crazy is that it was selling merchandise at approximately one third of the price it paid uh, paid to obtain it. Come on. Well, yeah. Oh, it was ridiculous. It was right? making it up in volume, though. Uh, well, 
It took me a second. I'm, I'm getting drunk. And so Pets.com uh, uh, tried to build the customer base using the same model Amazon. Discount, take the loss, but build a huge loyal base of, of uh, people that buy it. Uh, and uh, well, But it was impossible for it to turn a profit absorbing the cost of shipping these massive heavy bags of cat litter and, and cat, uh, cans of pet food, right? And so uh, – uh, um, and spe- specifically, those products tend to only have like a two to four percent profit margin. So, so like, so you're, let's you're, take the the absolute lowest <laughs> the lowest profit margin, heaviest item we can imagine, yeah, and make a company out of it. It sounds great. And sh- delivering it now. So, it, uh, like you were saying at the beginning, it became the sim- uh, symbolic of the mania of the dot com boom in the late nineteen nineties and early two thousands. Uh, and uh, and so really, it became very well known. But more importantly, it was the pet, uh, the the uh, the puppet that uh, that actually got a lot of the uh, memories of everyone going. And specifically, they they were they ran Super Bowl ads, and they were a part of. The, uh, they had their own float at the Macy's Thanksgiving parade. Uh, so they had that. And we'll talk about the puppet in just a moment. Uh, but it uh, but in the end. Uh, uh, it traded uh, at 19 cents the day it was liquidated on November 6th of the same year. So it, it, it basically IPO'd. And came public with all this fanfare and within less than a year. Yeah, 268 days. And, and basically... That's, they, they, actually, I wonder if that's a record for like at least for a big company. Yeah, Right, like I'm sure there's some crappy company that went IPO'd, but think about that. That's like Peloton coming out, and then within the same year, it's gone. It's gone. Okay, Dino, I gotta go to a lot of stores to get what you like. I'll be back. If you leave me now, you'll take away the biggest part of me. Ooh, no, baby, please don't go. I just want you to stay. Hey, man, I'm getting car sick. I think I'm going to be. It's gone. They just shut their doors. They said, we ran out of money. They lost. Okay, so the IP had $11 a share, but they lost $42 per share in the period that they, uh, like, literally, they burned all cash, all debt, everything, ju- and just zero. Like, Tesla, w- what everyone thought Tesla was going to do. Right. Um, and But Pets.com did it, right? But, now, that's a great story, but... What, what the reason why it immediately flagged for me when I was searching for a story was the puppet wars. Yeah, see, I had no idea about these puppet wars. Right. And so let's, let's start. Okay, so the puppet wars involved multiple puppets. And, but, and so it, uh, there's, there's uh, Triumph, the insult comic dog, and Ed's night uh, party, Ed the Sock. Uh, with, and so let's go through a little history of these puppets, and, and I'll tell the story. So first, let's start with the, the Canadian puppet. And so Ed the Sock, which was host of the Canadian Much Music late night show Ed's Night Party, started in 1987. So this is going way back in history. Some of our listeners weren't even born when, uh, when Ed the Sock was out there. And so here, let's quickly play a, a quick clip so everyone can see just who Ed is. Put down your clicker and pick up your liquor. It's time for Ed's Night Party. Starring me, Ed the Sock, and my co-host, Rihanna King. Welcome to Ed's Night Party. Now, now. So, going on, Ed the Sock, or at least the creators of Ed the Sock, accused... No, no, Ed the Sock is a real person. Ed the Sock is a real person. So, Ed... She accused Smeagol, the creator of Triumph, the insult comic dog, which got his fame from his appearances on uh, Conan O'Brien's late night show, uh, and accused him of ripping him off. Right. Right. But that, this was just them having a war of words. Right. right. And so uh, so let's let's actually play a fun clip of uh, of some of the best. What's your what was your favorite scene out of that? The tri- uh, Triumph. I'm a huge fan of when Triumph goes to the uh, Star Wars uh, kind of buying of tickets early where people are camped out. Let's play the tape because <laughs> it's right. just it's awesome. Lena, Lena, play that clip. But outside the Ziegfeld Theater is the real show. 
Return of the door. Unbelievable. Look, among the nerds, I found an actual girl here. Look at this. Not, not too shabby around here, huh, honey? The male-female ratio, yeah? I mean, you've got your ver veritable pick of the litter. You can choose from all of all kinds of guys who have no idea how to please you. <laughs> she said, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Who's going to stand up to this challenge? I will. <laughs> Here he is. <laughs> well, you're going to stand up to this? Yeah, right, and I'm stooping lassie. <laughs> Commitment. All these guys standing in line here all this time waiting for the show. How do you explain this to your imaginary girlfriend? <laughs> he did. He's really good, actually. If you go and you just Google best of triumph, oh, uh, triumph he was epic, the info right? Dog, and so, so I could totally see why Ed the Sock would be insulted as a good Canadian party animal. He's he had a, he had his thing going, and and here comes uh, the triumph, the insult comic dog. Like who uses a cigar? Like I mean, that's a ripoff. Anyway, <laughs> so so anyway, enough said. So then, triumph accused. The Pets.com puppet of ripping him off. But the Pets.com puppet didn't take this very well. <laughs> As one doesn't. You know, <laughs> and <you're>, so <laughs> it created the true puppet war. And so it led to Pets.com puppet um, uh, putting a $20 million lawsuit for demanding damages for defamation and, uh, and trade libel uh, on it. And... Well, you know what? It, um, Conan does a great job talking about it. So why, do, why don't we pay tribute to this absolute amazing puppet war and, and play this clip? I don't know if you're aware of this, but we have a, a pretty popular character on our show that we've, been, we've had for about three years mm -hmm. now. A triumph, the insult comic dog. And he, the, uh, we are now uh, in trouble with the Pets.com puppet. Well, do we have a picture of him? There he is right there. <laughs> I swear to God, I in no way asked for that response. <laughs> the Pets.com puppet, I guess, is suing Triumph, right? Because the Pets.com puppet says that Triumph has defamed, right? Right. The Pets.com puppet by saying that the Pets.com puppet ripped Triumph off. Is that right? And oddly enough, oddly enough, these, those lawyers are puppets. They're puppet lawyers. <laughs> yeah, right, right. The whole thing is in puppet court. You can't just get a regular lawyer. You no. need a puppet lawyer. Puppet lawyer. And uh, we're just enjoying this because it's literally a sock puppet suing a sock puppet. Well, a sock puppet suing a rubber a puppet. A rubber puppet. And yeah. why can't those two kinds of puppets learn to get along? Mm. Have we not learned anything? We've learned nothing from the past. And actually, I have a copy of the real lawsuit right here. I did not make this up. You have to hear this. It's uh, this is the uh, lawsuit. It alleges that Triumph is a plaintiff. Triumph. It, I'm not making this up. Plaintiff uh, alleges that Triumph is a rubber dog, black and brown in color, that wears a gold bow tie, often smokes a cigar, <laughs> and interacts with animals and with humans through rude and often vulgar comments and physical actions and or attacks. That's... <laughs> to the sock puppet who is an advocate of pets the voice of pets and often interacts and communicates directly with other animals or with humans in order to convey to pet owners how pets feel about various pet related issues so regular mother Teresa yeah he's helping people well that's just unbelievable <laughs> That there was a lawsuit filed on this. A puppet suing another puppet <laughs> in puppet court. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> With puppet lawyers. It's just awesome. <laughs> Who would have thought? I just I had forgotten this whole part of the story. You know, like I knew pets.com, but I didn't realize that there was this massive pet uh, puppet war going on behind the scenes. Oh, absolutely. So all of uh, all of our listeners have homework. They have to go and find uh, uh, check out all the Ed, Ed the Sock episodes. Go back and listen to uh, uh, some of the best of Triumph. And, uh, and of course, no, there's nothing else to say about the Pets.com. No, the pet, he's, yeah. he's, he's dead. He's they, we buried him in the backyard. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, buddy. It's time for the WTF clip of the week. All right. So what do you what do you have in store oh, for God, us? God, again, you know, Joe Kernan and Professor Siegel. I don't know what a combination. Them. What did you call him, by the way? And the, the Spiegel. Spiegel. Like <laughs> like Schmiegel? Like from Lord of the Lord of the Rings. Anyway, it's he just again they get on there and they just provide me with ample material. Now, I am a little all over the map on this because because I've been out of practice on the WTF. And yeah, so there really isn't like a weeks. theme, there isn't a real theme on this, but it just that uh I, I heard him speak, and I was like, we gotta, we got to do something with this, and I put some different things in there. So let's run the tape. About 700 points away uh, from the Dow, 30,000 level. Let's talk more about what's powering the rally. Joining us, Jeremy Siegel, professor of finance at the Wharton School, which I've heard of, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor, how you doing? Good to see you. Good morning. One of I'm the thing, one Thanks. of the things we said earlier, uh, I, I, there may be no one more associated with Dow thirty thousand than you because in, in twenty thousand, and I think you even have, have gone higher than that. So we know that that you've been right, and you've said stay long. You've been bullish, but we did say that that you talked about something that might derail the um, the bull market. Is, is there something specific that's changed in your in your view, or they ask you, or people ask you, and you said, well, this could happen? What what? Do you have a different view, viewpoint now on the long-term bull? Well, suddenly anything can happen. No shit, Sherlock! Uh, what I'm pointing out is that we, we are trading around 20 times this year's earnings, or my estimate of this year's earnings. I mean, that is not out, uh, unreasonable, low interest rate environment in today's world, but it's certainly not cheap. Uh, I also worry about Momentum players, I think in the last two or three years, we've had more and more momentum players that jump on to trends. And that's what I talked about in January. Uh, now, we had the virus come in, kind of interrupted it. Now, are we, we going to get back to that trend? Uh, what I saw two years ago is uh, in 2018, remember, we were straight up in January. Again, when people forget about valuations, the market could get too high. No oh, shit, Sherlock. We're not there yet, but right now, this year, I you know expect five, uh, five to ten percent total return. Uh, I'm a little bit down today on on the opening, but we were at four yesterday. So, you know, how much more was in the gas tank? You gotta be fucking kidding. That being said, uh, you know, we're, what, 2% away from 30,000. I think if we, if there was good news on this virus front, uh, we would pop above 30,000, I think, without question. Hey there, champ. A friend told me you got a little too high. I'm sorry, pal. This sucks. You may feel like you've gone permanently insane or like you're dead. Here's the good news. You're alive and your sanity is probably intact. You're just really, really high. <laughs> My favorite part is the, the, the last little bit. Yeah. No, you're just high. <laughs> he, and, and like, I don't know how they get him on so often. If you're like, do you watch CNBC? Uh, I do. Yes. And like, he's on all the time and he doesn't say anything. Like, just... He's worse than a technician. If it goes up, I'll buy it. And if I sell it, it'll go, <laughs> uh, if it goes down, I'll sell it. Like, all he does is just kind of say things. That's why I was like, no shit, Sherlock. No shit, Sherlock. That's funny. Anyways, I like the guy. I, I, nothing really against him. Joe Kernan, on the other hand, is a pompous ass. But, uh, you know, if they keep serving me up material like that, I'm going to have to keep making WTF videos of them. There you go. You heard it right from Kev. All right. It's time for our top three things to watch next week. So, Kev, uh, l let's go through our list. And what I wanted to start off with is just uh, talk a, a, a little bit about uh, treasury bonds and gold. Because, uh, you know, I mean, you have some pretty strong opinions about what bonds we're going to do over the long term. But I want to stretch, uh, I want to emphasize that your view is turning to being very long term. <laughs> Right, like uh, you are long-term bearish bonds, right? And but the uh, but obviously the coronavirus could, and you you can push back on me, could be uh, driving a global economic slowdown. 
Oh, and, well, no, and, it's not and, good. I'm and, not going to push back. It and, is driving a global and, economic slowdown. It is. The and, only question is, is it in the price? That's all we have to ask. All, it, but yes, is it in the price? And I don't think it is. Because I, everyone that I heard, like uh, is everyone just anyone who starts doomsdaying about the coronavirus spreading, even though there's been there was a CNN uh, and piece with the CDC talking about how it could be extended. The point is, is that most people are like, yeah, this will just blow over. I, you know what? I think that there's a wake up call still coming, but I, I don't think it's priced in. But the point is, is Treasury bonds have more. I'm using the TLT here, which is 20 years, so we're going really long term here on that, like uh, not even the 10 years, but I wanted to really kind of point out, it's like, if we, if it looks like there could be 2% of global GDP shaved off from a slowdown, uh, I don't know if that uh, could be defined as a recession or not, but let's call it a slowdown. I mean, that certainly offers the opportunity for interest rates to revert back to their lowest points and even go lower. Uh, and uh, I, I'm asking the question, do we have another leg breaking out here? I mean, is, are we going to see a TLT going to 155? I uh, think I'm, it's coming. I, 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 yeah. Yeah, I do. So I won't disagree with you, uh, which is probably scary. Yeah. You probably so don't everyone want should that. sell it. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, and I will tell you something that uh, I am long um, volatility on. On the bonds? Fix, yeah. Because okay. I think that. The market is probably underestimating the chance that these things are going to move. Right. I I think that when I look at uh, bonds, I'm a little scared by them. And uh, today, especially this is Friday, they've been seeming to get a bit out of nowhere. I know it's going into a long weekend and the people are just scared that it's going to be bad news. Maybe we'll get up Tuesday and we'll be back to selling them. But... Patrick, I'm not, I'm not going to take the other side, so it's probably the top of the range and we're headed lower. There you go. So the, the other one there, though, is gold. And the one thing I wanted to point out is, is that uh, gold had every reason just the other week. Of uh, as a technician, whenever you see a sequence of heavy selling like these red candles, they often would trigger a lot of technical signals that uh, traders would act upon, which creates that uh, that uh, feedback mechanism and creates a, a trend move. And what's interesting is that the the bulls came right in and bought the dip and held the price. And so it, it feels like that the bulls are actually digging in and defending the price on every dip. And that, the, that to me, uh, like bonds, is, is showing characteristics that of accumulation. And um, I'm, I'm going to be watching definitely going into, uh, into the next week and week after whether or not the bulls can build on this momentum. Like we have not broken to a higher high, which as a technician you would say, I buy if it goes higher, right? Yeah. Uh, so so you, can, you can talk your smack all you want. But the point is, is that I'm very curious as to whether the bulls can actually – muster up some momentum to take this higher well patrick i'll again get on your kind of bull wagon here and say oh, no, the other, is, don't gooch this i know i'm gonna go it. the if you look at the u.s dollar it's been like running like it stole something or like yeah. Forrest gump and and, and the reality gold. is that gold is hung in there like a champ considering the strength of the u.s dollar yeah is this just safe haven in the you know bid from the coronavirus? And if we get a situation like Professor Schmiegel says that all of a sudden it gets fixed up overnight, it all gets sold. I don't know, uh, but I think that if you think about um, kind of my scenario, which is that there's a lot of stimulus coming, that stimulus will be inflationary. I agree with you that the world economy is slowing and that they're going to, at the very least, keep real rates lower. And if you think about what's positive for gold. Low real rates is what yeah. uh, is the biggest it's, driving it's factor. One of them, yeah. So I actually even like your long there's gold also, better than your long bonds, buddy. There's all, it's also important to have more buyers than sellers. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go on that <laughs> profound piece of wisdom. Let's go to number two. Next week we get multiple FOMC speakers. Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, like you know five what? Five of them. We get uh, Neil Kashkari, which I think that uh, President Trump was an idiot not to assign him to be the head of the Federal Reserve. That's in actually, hindsight. Yeah. Well, I said it at the time. You did. Yeah. You did. And people were uh, like, I kind of joked about it and said, "That's the that's the Fed's uh, that's the president's man. Like that's the guy, because he is the most dovish, crazy guy. He makes me look like uh, <laughs> like in terms of easy easy money and just kind of stimulating. That yeah. guy thinks that we should go pedal the metal at all times." 
anyways, there's going to be a lot to, of uh, different speakers. It'll be interesting to see what they say. I think when we were chatting about this earlier, you said something to the effect like, what are they going to do? They're not going to say anything different than, uh, uh, than uh, but you, but you Powell think they did. Will. I, I think you're watching for signs about how worried they are in terms of this coronavirus. And then I'm more worried on the other side. I'm still concerned that they're looking at the stock market and they're looking at the credit spreads and they're going to get nervous about it. And so, although I'm not predicting it, I'm worried that you might get some of the more hawkish members, and Kashkari will not be one of them, but some of the more hawkish members leaning, trying to talk down the market. Well, you know what? The the problem is is that it's very hard for them to provide easing when the market is, is going to take... Uh, a, a a dovish tone like if the, if if they give a dovish tone then the market's just going to rip even further right like right. They so have, they that's have, my they point have is to that stop they, fueling it that's right so to to some extent they're kind of back to their situation where they always used to fight the kind of market's tendency to keep rates lower yeah right like the market would go and start pricing and easing and then they would try to stop it i don't know it'll be difficult to do that in, in this environment because the reality is that you're correct that the there's a lot of uncertainty with this coronavirus. We're still a long way. You know, half of Asia is still holed up in their apartments and yeah. uh, it's, it's not good. So this, uh, I don't know, Patrick, I just think it's something to watch for. All right. Well, you heard it from Kev. So let's number one, obviously a number of the PMIs and you're a big fan of PMIs as leading indicators, right? Like, Well, if- they're just faster than a lot of the other d- data. Like by the time you get like a GDP number, you're looking like that's months ago. It's almost yeah. useless. Like, a, But PMIs are one of the more quick uh, indicators so you can get a sense for the economy and how it's doing. And that's what we need to be watching. We need to be watching for the kind of a decision about how much this is affecting the econ- like the world's economy. We know that Asia has stopped, but has it stopped Europe? Has it stopped the U.S.? I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know. And I think that the, most people don't. And if someone tells you they do, they're probably lying. Uh, <laughs> maybe they'll get lucky with their guess. But there's a lot of uncertainty out there. And so what you need to do is you need to watch for this uh, these PMIs because – up until now, we, most of the data, the economic data we get was kind of backward looking and the markets just kind of looks through it because they say it doesn't matter because now the whole world's changed with the advent of the, the, the Wu-Tang flu thing or whatever, yeah. right? So uh, anyways, that's what I think we should watch next week. European and U.S. PMIs. Keep your eyes peeled. All right, Kev. Parting words of wisdom. You came up with this one. Or at least Steve did, but you. Oh, I didn't. It. It's actually I was thinking about you because it was uh, Steve Eisner, and you know uh, he says the hardest thing to do is shrink yourself to profitability. And that was Steve Eisner from The Big Short, you know, yeah. the, the fellow uh, uh, Steve Carell. Yeah. And uh, and you know what bank he was talking about? No. Come on, you no, don't I know? don't. Deutsche Bank. Really? Yeah. So he's been a big bear in Deutsche Bank. Let's just dial the stock as a little fun thing to do here. As well, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a, another victory lap for you. <laughs> Piece of shit. <laughs> All right, I'll do it just for you. Okay, let's have a look. But anyways, he's right. Steve is right that it is hard to shrink yourself to profitability. Yet somehow, Deutsche Bank seems to be doing that. <sighs> And you know what I will say? I'm not going to say that they're shrinking themselves to profitability. I say that the stock was just so beat up and the worst was in it. And that the company still stinks. And that <laughs> from a fundamental perspective, they're probably – all of the bears are correct. What they uh, – what I think they missed was that the, it, it was priced for the – Well, the yeah. One, once uh, – it, it was so – everyone was so bearish and it was so bad for so long. I mean that was definitely the one risk I had going – taking the other side of that bet. I was betting on the prevailing trend continuing. Uh, and uh, and you were betting on the fact that this has all been so baked into the cake that yeah. it, it's easy for it to respond the other way, right? Right. It doesn't take much. Like, do I think the Deutsche Bank is a terrific bank that's going to be making all sorts you of do. money? You do. That's where you hold your deposit, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> me, and, me and Jim Cramer, although he's still trying to get the money out of Bear Stearns. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so uh, – Anyway, let's uh, let's wrap up the show here. So, um, well, first of all, thanks everyone for sticking around this long. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> so, and anyone um, that uh, uh, wants, uh, well, obviously, we are on YouTube as well as uh, you could listen to it on any podcast player. So, make sure you subscribe, rate the show if uh, if you like it. Um, make sure you follow us, and if you, we send out an email. 
on a um, uh, to always uh, whenever the show is launched. And in there, we include the links to chart books right. and all other really great things. We don't spam you or, or get, uh, uh, share your email with anybody. So if you want to be receiving the Market Huddle update and all of the links and all the Market Huddle meetups and everything like that, make sure you go to the Market Huddle website and register for it. Anything else I forgot? No, nothing. Uh, that's it. So just uh, thanks for a great show, Patrick. It's uh, where can people find more about you and uh, and uh, kind you, of if they want to reach out to you? You can uh, find me uh, at BigPictureTrading.com or you can follow me on Twitter at Patrick Serezna. And I'm uh, at Kevin Muir, M-U-I-R, and at TheMacroTourist.com. Thanks for listening. It's been a great show. We'll see you next week. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. We'll try that again. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> we fucked that up, I know. Oh, my God. Bye. <laughs> Usually, we're gonna leave it. Yeah, for we'll sure. Better, of course, we're gonna leave it. after after we're seventy episodes. Yeah. We'll yeah. be fine. Nah, like, no, we're we're only it. at sixty-seven. Okay, I am. I promise you. We got a lot to talk seven. about today. You do. Okay, sorry. In terms no. of the after. No, no, you don't need to apologize. We just got a lot to talk about in the after hours here. First of all, okay, I'm going for another beer here. By the way, all right. Which which reminds me, we got to break the beer. Oh, that's right. Let's do that. Yeah, we forgot about that. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna crack another. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. I, I, listen, I, I, I'm I'm swayed by the story, man. The story just got me. Like, it's yeah, that's, like what a great story. I like, just, I, like, but if you if, if you didn't know the story, how would you I, rate the beer? I, I, but I can't, because the story's in my mind. It's captured my imagination. I just love it. It's yeah, just like you cannot unknow it, I cannot your, know what you already it. So know. I'm 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 going a solid eight four. Wow, even though, that's oh, awesome. That's pretty high. I, just, I love the story. I love the story. This Doc Purdue guy, he just he seems like my kind of guy. Okay, okay, okay. You said gave it a a four, yeah. but would you buy a six pack? As long as I could read the story. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the same story on every can. What? <laughs> like it's a different story. Really? It's not a story about Doc Purdue on each and every different can. <laughs> it would be awesome if it was a different story. Yeah, on each it one. would be awesome. All right, that'd be a lot of work though. Alina, how about you? I would give it a seven point six. All right, which is... Um, That's probably... You know what? Lena and I are very it's similar decent. often. It's just, I think that there's probably at least 100 basis points of, of, of story inflation in my... In my there in you my go. <laughs> it, it's, it's funny, though, because we really do... Right, because I mean, the sponsors are kind enough to send. We never really give a sponsor under five, unless no, I have. Unless, uh, yeah, unless <laughs> Kevin, yeah, Kevin has. is really disappointed. Yeah, I and um, like as in that I could not finish this can to get this out of my or sight. Or it's purple when I open it up, and it's purple. <laughs> That's not a beer. Not beer. That's, That's not, a, not beer. a beer. But um, you know what I. I think Kev gave it a good score. I'm going to do 8.5 just to give him a little bit of a. You did 8.4. Yeah, 8.4. Yeah, I just want to be. Uh, I want to be a, a 10 basis points above you there. Okay. Um, but <laughs> always a competition. It is a competition because actually I do enjoy it. I would buy this beer. This is actually a beer that I think is is delicious, and um, I wouldn't say it's my favorite beer, but it's definitely one that I would never object to drinking. Okay. So now that we've got the beer out of the way, let's, we got a lot of things to talk about. First of all, for those that are listening at home, I just want to say that the uh, cover art that we have this week is <laughs> this article that I found. And I don't know if anyone remembers, but Florida had a cold spell a little while ago. And it got so cold that all the iguanas would fall out of trees. They would basically freeze in place and then just fall out of trees, okay? That's awesome. And the thing about them is that they didn't actually die. They just kind of freeze for like, you know, for a day or two. And then it heats up again. And they're like, oh, geez, that was a th what happened for those two days? I was sleeping on the floor here. So people go around and they scoop them up because people eat iguanas. I didn't realize this. Did, did, did you know people this? People eat iguanas? Yeah. Did you know this? No, I thought they just had them as pets. No, no. That'd be a lot of pets. So people scoop them up because like you can eat the iguanas. So this dude goes and he, you know, takes like 20 or 40 of these iguanas. He goes like just picking them up everywhere and stuff and throws them in the back of his car. And he's driving back. I think he's from Mexico, but I can't remember. Anyway, he's driving somewhere. Okay. And during this point, the iguanas, it starts to heat up. <laughs> the car heats up and the iguanas come to life. Oh and all God. of a sudden his car is like full of live iguanas. Yeah. 
and he gets so in a like car accident. Up from like yeah, a so it, like the headline piece. is guy in Florida, which of course it's it Florida. has to be from Florida. It has to be from Florida. Guy in Florida loads car with frozen iguanas. They warm up, come back to life, cause car accident. And then, so this happened, and I was asking, can we really know that this wasn't Patrick? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> me, listen. This is like me, a squirrel me and Luke for Florida, were down right? there, and there's no yeah, evidence. Squirrel. I, I don't never forget, talked about hey, the rental. Let's do, let's do, well, actually let's talk about squirrels here, because like Lena brought it up. Patrick, iguanas are like I haven't eaten a squirrel. Lena, I haven't eaten a squirrel. Have you? <laughs> no, but we know somebody who has. Patrick, have you eaten a squirrel? <laughs> yes, I've eaten a squirrel. <laughs> yes, I have. Let's not talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then All then, right. So I mean. I went moose hunting, of course and then you I did. didn't get a moose, but, but I got squirrel. a squirrel. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> did you eat it on a stick or whatever? Like, did you? No, we um, we put it we put it in the oven. You put it in the oven? Yeah. How, like, did, they properly cooked it. Did you fillet it? Like, like you like? Yeah, it was nicely broiled. Oh god, I don't know how can there be any meat on there? Like, barely, barely. Yeah. Oh. Okay, I let's change the topic. Okay, we got to yeah. talk about something else. You know, yeah, like, we got to talk about something else. And, and everyone who's ever making fun of uh, the Chinese people eating bats, we got to remember that Patrick eats squirrels. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the next thing we got to talk about is Valentine's Day. So, That's right. uh, first of all, I didn't realize that February 13th is Galentine's Day. Did you? Oh, I didn't know that either. Oh, Galentine's Day? That's um, it's from I much for prefer, girls, right? I much prefer Parks, March 14th, but I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, else. we're going to talk about that in a second. No, we're that's, not. That's Valentine's Day is from Parks and Recreation. It's basically um, it's uh, the the main character, the Amy Poehler uh, that thing. It's basically for women to get together. It's uh, it's February 13th. I think Valentine's Day was re- invented by women. Well, we know it was. <laughs> <laughs> we know it was. We know and we know March 14th was invented by men. That's but, right. Uh, but we're so not I gonna... had no idea about this March 14th. And yeah, Patrick starts everyone going Google on it. about We're not going to say anything like, else. Just Google it. And well, Why did you bring it up if you weren't going to no, say anything? No, I'm right. not going to talk about it because it's kind of, it's not very, uh, yeah. I don't know. We'll, it's yeah, not say it. It's, um, you say it because I'm not going to say it. Well, no, Patrick. It's a rated mature comment. It's, uh, That's well, why we can't say it. it it involves it's a, it, it, guys it, made the day. Guys, guys made, the, made the day. Guys made the day, and <laughs> and it involves a steak and something else. And just that's all I can say. Just go March 14th steak, and then that's all you need to know. And uh, it just it it sounds like an interesting day. <laughs> I'm actually quite surprised it hasn't caught on. <laughs> You're surprised. You're surprised because I'm not. <laughs> it needs two willing parties, right? <laughs> God, it sounds like something Ron Swanson from uh, Parks and Rex would come up with. <laughs> Although he would never That's say something so, so true. he wouldn't say something so like rude. But anyway, okay, well that's it. That's um, Lena, what do you have planned for uh, Valentine's Day? Um, we actually don't have any plans. No, because <laughs> I'm working. That's oh, right. we, oh, there's a dig. Oh, that's, a dig. that's a dig. That's a dig. That's a dig. You know what? You should ask but your boss for a raise. Yeah, you should. You should get right? every time. Uh, get... Seriously. Who's that douchebag of a we boss? Did all the... <laughs> Who is that guy? <laughs> we did all the Valentine's Day stuff in the morning. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. T- uh, TMI. Okay. TMI. We're going to let that what? go. No, no, no. You, you guys... Are, you, okay, your minds are going to the gutter because you guys are thinking about steak and something else. <laughs> no, I meant like... Oh, I got flowers. I got Aww. I got a surprise this afternoon. Luke got me a piano. A piano? What? Yeah, because I said I wanted a piano. Like, did you get a like, like a full size piano? No, it's an electric, not a keyboard, but it's an electric piano what kind that you, you can get? also plug in your headset. It's a kawaii piano. It's it's not new, but I had I been playing piano all my life so and i hadn't Aww. played piano in a while so i said oh it'd be kind of nice to have a what piano a nice in the house. Guy. so are you like are, nice did you play like rock and roll songs or are you just like a classical pianist pianist classical and jazz more, oh jazz but so I um i could if i have the scores i can pretty much play you can it. play anything um, like a real one. that's awesome well not anything really so what, good but so what I, I, I can still read it up so I, I gotta tell you 
I play a little guitar, and so we cheat. Oh. We cheat, and we have like capos. So when we want to change keys, we just basically go and put a capo on there so that we can change yeah, keys, yeah. right? Yeah. Pianists amaze me because like I'm always asking them like, okay, so if I gave you this and I said let's just change this to like you know like from G yeah. to you know do whatever, would you be able to do it? And they go, yeah, whatever. they could just do it. And I was like, that's crazy, right? Well, it's kind of you're doing the same thing, just you're just shifting. I know, it but the they're sharps and shit. Right? Like it's hard. Yeah. Like it's not like like guitar that's is nice and linear. Like there's like there's it, yours is kind of messed it's, up. It's 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 a it's a complicated process. Yeah. So what I like best, okay, I have two things. First of all, I like the rock and roll guys that actually aren't real piano players and sit there and learn everything in C and then just use their computer program to move it to whatever key they want it to be in. <laughs> Auto-tune for piano. Well, not auto-tune. It's like a cable for the piano. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, like, they're, like, I've seen them. And, like, you know, one of the things is that, uh, like, sometimes a uh, rock and roll guy has trouble when they get older. They start having to sing stuff lower than the, where they originally recorded. And yeah. so, like, if a song's written in C, he's going to have to go to B-flat, which is sometimes, like, in guitar, though sometimes you'll just mm -hmm. tune it a half step down. But in piano, yeah. like all of a sudden, if you start going lower, you just like have to shift everything down. And there's, yeah. I can't remember. There's one. There's, what's the one with like the most sharps or the most flats? There's like one key that's oh. really ugly. I I couldn't even tell you. Anyway. I, I I'm brushing up on music theory okay. right now. Well, and then the other thing about it is that when we uh, go and on the piano, I saw this thing with Billy Joel, and I, there's this guy, this kid was at uh, Billy Joel was playing at a at a at a university. And he put his hand up. They were asking questions. He says, "You know what? I'd really like to uh, play with you. I was wondering if I could get up there and play uh, play a song with you, in New York State of Mind." And he got oh, wow. and Billy Joel was like, "Whoa!" And he's like, "Okay." And so he comes up Ballsy. and he says, "What key do you know it in?" And the kid says, "I'll play it in whatever key you want it." And I was like, Whoa. "I was like, that's bold because like, what if he that what if really he, what if he says some weird shitty key that you don't know, right?" And it was, he yeah, was awesome. Yeah. He was obviously a prof like uh, you know he was studying music for a like living. A music anyway, it's Google. Program. It's really yeah. interesting. It's really it's really he did an amazing job and it was really fun. Oh, Anyways, I'm glad you got your wow. piano. <laughs> we'll let it Thank go, you. Patrick. What are you guys gonna we're do? Not do Listen, we've been married for 20 years, both of us. We're not doing anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nothing Pat we're talking about anyway. <laughs> Patrick's like giving me the wrap up signal. Like he he's got no. Like, we got to do this. All right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm I I got to get out of here. Yeah, me too. Okay. Okay. Well, anyways, thanks for everything. Lena, thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of Happy your Valentine's evening. Lena. Happy yeah. Valentine's Day, and make Happy sure Valentine's your boss Day. sends you something, uh, yeah. so, something good for making your work on Valentine's yeah. Day. I hear that guys. Are, Maybe more beer. I hear okay. that guys are real asshole. Yeah, I heard he's. Okay. Have a great weekend, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, everyone.